Hi, everybody. Welcome to Gathering of the Minds. I'm Lev Poliaka, the uh, chair of the Art and Technology Committee, and I am very, very excited to have all of you fine people here today for this event where we've gotten people of different views, but at the same time, they all stand for uh, anti-censorship. And that's the thing, right? Like, I have no idea what you guys think as far as what the world should be like. Probably you guys would get into really big arguments if some of you were uh, left with each other for a very long time. But that's besides the point, because there is another force that we are all fighting against right now, which is the force that seeks to uh, divide us and make us fight amongst ourselves. And the force that seeks to withhold information from us. So as long as we don't worry that much about certain disagreements and can civilly sit with each other and talk about it, then that's it. Then we can work against whatever whatever this thing is. So with that, I want to uh, bring the uh, focus on my wonderful panel over here. We've got Tim Poole, we've got Bill Ahmed and Mines, we've got Elmer Goldfeld, and we've got Lionel. And let us start with uh, the person who uh, helped me make this event a reality, Bill Ahmed. Thanks, Lionel. Everyone. So my name is Bill Ahmed. I founded Minds, Minds.com, Minds.org. Check them out. We're a free speech social social network, open source, encrypted. You get rewarded with digital currency for being active on the app. You can actually exchange that currency for more views on your content or peer to peer with other creators. And we're trying to create a space where creators can make money or living, be independent, and not be censored. So we're taking the stance that the best way to fight hate speech is actually with free speech. So we don't censor anything as long as it's legal in the US. And there's something happening, generally speaking, on the internet with censorship on proprietary surveillance platforms. And people are pretty pissed, so that's why we're here. Tim. Howdy, uh, my name is Tim Poole. I was, uh, I'm a journalist and technologist. I was a founding member of Vice News several years ago. I worked for a company called Fusion for a couple of years. And in the past year, I've been entirely independent, producing my content on YouTube and Twitter and other platforms. And I, I don't think I've dealt with the worst censorship. Certainly there are many people I feel have been wrongly banned or taken offline, but I do have some really interesting moments where I was wrong, wrongly silenced. I don't think it's that bad, but I think we'll have an interesting discussion, so thanks for having me. Let's go to Eleanor. Uh, hi, I'm Eleanor Goldfield. I'm a um, creative activist, a journalist, um, and a few other things. Um, I have a show that airs on Free Speech TV. Uh, it's called Act Out. Uh, that's my primary form of my journalism. And uh, of course, as part of the alternative media, I have been um, severely throttled on places like Google and Facebook. So that's why I'm happy that things like Minds exist. Um, so I'm happy to be here. <coughs> Excuse me. My name is Lionel. One name, like God. I am a uh, Practicing lawyer, I this is my 30th year in uh, professional talk radio and the like. So I've been around uh, various aspects of of, uh, of um, limited speech and the like. I uh, do media and legal analysis. Uh, I have my own YouTube platform as well, and I am so glad to be here tonight. Thank you, guys. You're welcome, Lionel. So, from the panelists uh, who are here. What is well, your sticks in there? Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> All right, sticks. Also known as oh shit. Most people know. I'm I'm up on the wall, so it's uh, harder to see me. Uh, I, my name is Sticks Hexenhammer six six six. Real name Tarl Warwick. I wanted my uh, stage name to be as unpronounceable as my real name. Uh, YouTuber, uh, author, editor. Uh, for some time now, I can remember YouTube 10 years ago, and I can remember the dark old days of the censorship that we got at the time uh, from the moralists that existed then. Uh, my concern in the last couple of years has really morphed uh, from maybe a more partisan angle uh, or even a third party sort of independent angle uh, towards simply wanting to combat censorship itself. Uh, I've seen lately it's interesting. Uh, to see people branching out to other platforms because uh, I have always considered myself a YouTuber. Uh, I then had to branch out to other sites and now I have a, a multi-platform presence. 
uh, that I think it's important for people to actually uh, have in this uh, day and age of the tech world. So can I ask a question real quick? Sure. This is being live streamed on YouTube, right? This is being live streamed okay. from a Stixis account. You guys just swore and the video's been demonetized most likely. <laughs> Uh-oh. We're using the enemy platform to combat yep. it. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't swear, they'll, they'll turn off your ads. Uh, I take full response. Oh, by the way, the demonetization has nothing to do with swearing. It has a lot to do with who you are and what you're saying. Mm. Because you will notice demonetization before you even go public by virtue of the subject matter and who you are. You can be some of the most vile, I, I didn't mean to jump into this, but you can be the most vile a uh, person spewing F-bombs in, in, in sorting fashion, you're okay. But depending upon if you fall into certain categories, I've noticed, for example, one time, just as an example, the YouTube title was, Why I Love This Country, something like that, or Why Puppies Are Cute. I did it deliberately, never said a word. I look, and it immediately says, not advertiser friends, have a post it why, why puppies are cute, so I... Well, I, I actually agree with you. Uh, I made a video in South Korea called something like Visiting the Raccoon Cafe. Literally just me and a friend for seven minutes laughing and throwing food at raccoons in a South Korean cafe. <laughs> Demonetized, yeah. <laughs> so what do you guys think is the reason that all this demonetization is going on? And uh, furthermore, what have your experiences mm -hmm. been with this uh, demonetization from the very beginning? Like, did you see it growing into something that it is right now with the YouTube purge over time? Or how, how did it all work out for you guys? Well, it's interesting. If you look at the history of places like Twitter and YouTube, I mean, they started out with their roots in free speech. Twitter's slogan was free speech wing of the free speech party. So there is inner turmoil happening within these companies. It's not black and white. Like, they're evil. You know, alternative platforms are good. There are people there who want to do good things. But it seems like the power structure in those companies are more extractive pro-surveillance, pro-censorship, so it's, it's an idea. Yes. I don't know, what, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, mean, I agree, I think it does, like Lionel said, it has everything to do with who you are and your history and uh, what, you're, what you're talking about. Um, for example, I noticed a friend of mine put up a, a post that said, uh, that said something about Israel, and then it, not only was it demonetized, but they actually started losing subscribers, like YouTube will knock subscribers off and he started getting messages like hey I had to resubscribe to your YouTube channel like four different times he then changed the the name of the video so it, instead of saying like Israel something something it was all one word so it was kind of impossible to like to, to take out and all of a sudden it was like oh this is fine it didn't like it didn't pop up on their scanners I guess as being just Israel because he made it like one long ridiculous word and so it's very clear that what is being censored uh, is is what you're talking about, and particularly if you are part of a part of a larger network, uh, you know, like RT America or like the Young Turks or other alternative media sites, um, mid press news and things like that, like have been really, really lambasted with that sort of uh, censorship on YouTube in particular, but also on other uh, sites as well. I, I want to uh, just point out. I, I have been looking at demonetization for a long time. I've got a friend who's got a big YouTube channel who was demonetized before anyone even talked about demonetization. So, so right now, when they demonetize, you get a little yellow dollar sign, meaning there's limited ads. And my, my buddy, he runs a channel called We Are Change. He was having his ads just turned off. Someone at Google was going in and turning the ads off on his channel. I've been looking at this for a long time. I, I really can't understand how it works because you know they'll claim it's sensitive issues. Okay, if that was the case, then why are mainstream news outlets allowed to talk about, say, the Florida incident or other Las Vegas and run ads on it just fine? Oh, well, they're in a preferred network, things like that. Huh. Yet, then there are people, I actually see uh, channels on YouTube where you actually have a guy in, like, clan robes, and it's running ads, and I'm just like, clearly it's not <laughs> politics. I don't know what it is, but perhaps it's us, or I don't think it has to do with advertisers being scared. I really can't figure it out. Sticks, what do you think it has to do with I think that it has to do specifically with issues of a partisan uh, type uh, that certain people, not necessarily even at YouTube, but I think people working with them don't like. For instance, uh, we've seen that they're working now with certain NGOs. They've put out ads literally showcasing the sort of things that they're looking into. Some of these have to do with it literally, explicitly, with the ADL's uh, recent readout. Gun rights appear to be on that list. At the very least, occasionally, you're going to have people censored. 
uh, who are speaking about pro-Second Amendment issues, even if it has nothing to do with what they would even class as they are maybe a politicized uh, NGO, uh, really to do with what they would also classify as hate. I think there are probably people within the big tech firms who themselves have bias. I think that almost, though, takes a, a back seat at this point uh, in a monetization sense to people who are members of third party groups. We saw ultimately it was the legacy media, when my word for you know the corporate media, the corporate media and some of the ad firms uh, really that cracked down on YouTube and really as a preface to their uh, late uh, spree of demonetization censorship, the strikes that we've had with the YouTube purge. And we've seen the fruits of that. They now claim that some of the people uh, who were accidentally banned uh, under the YouTube purge, it was just an accident. Literally, uh, you know, these new staff, they didn't quite knew what they were, know what they were doing uh, and that that was the problem. I highly doubt that, to tell the truth. It, it actually kept happening. That after YouTube said that it was a mistake and their moderators were learning, it happened for several more days where more mistakes kept happening, even though, even though they acknowledged it. May I ask, does everybody know what we're talking about with monetization? Is it this? this yeah. Okay, good, good. Because, you know, the story started off um, t taking the side of YouTube and Alphabet, just for a second, for some reason or another, I don't know why, but apparently Kraft Macaroni and Cheese took great umbrage of having their ads um, start off or begin a, an ISIS beheading video. <laughs> now, I don't know why somebody didn't say with all of the algorithms and all of the, the, uh, the, the and, and I, I, I say algorithm like I know what that was talking about, but you would think somebody would be able to say, hey, this is a video, it has a beheading in here, and it's not a movie. So instead of saying, why don't we do our best to perhaps maybe look at these videos a little bit better, or ask advertisers, do you mind an, an ISIS uh, ad? And who knows? They immediately just said, everybody must fall under this incredible dragnet of overreaction. So it kind of made sense. The other problem is there is no First Amendment against private entities. There is no First Amendment protection against a private company telling you you can't do something. That's their way out. It's not the government. It's just Google, which is the government. <laughs> yeah, it seems like they're missing the point with what most advertisers probably want. So if a computer company wants to sell a computer, realistically, they want to sell a computer to people no matter their political belief, because people need computers. So, but YouTube is assuming that's not true, and they're assuming that the advertisers only want to sell computers to certain type of people. So we're trying to create more of a decentralized ad network where you know there, there's just no censorship in regards to, or, or arbitrary, subjective decisions made with regards to advertising. People should be able to advertise what they want and with who they want when they want to. There, there's something interesting that I noticed in a study that came out a little while, a little while ago from Oxford where they claimed that Trump supporters share the most fake news. I just want to preface this with the study was a, was a their seed list of news sources was predominantly conservative, so don't be surprised if you find Trump supporters share the most conservative news. But what they also found was that when they clustered, when they created a, a map of the various political factions from right to left, Democrat, Republican, Trump, and the resistance, brand marketing, content produced by brands to sell products, predominantly fell in the resistance category. That's, you know, anti-Trump, Trump impeach, very activist -y groups that are very, you know, anti-Russia, that kind of stuff. That's a question. Are you, are you worried about the ads that are taken off your sites or your content being destroyed? I mean, it sounds like you're more worried about the money you're not making or something. I'm not understanding quite. Is this about the content that's not being seen because you're worried about your message is not getting out, or is it because your ads are being wiped There's out? multiple layers of censorship happening. Them? So there's, yeah. there's censorship of content, just a video being up uploaded, and then it being taken down for X, Y, Z reason. But then there's censorship sort of in a not allowing certain content to make money. So taking out, taking the livelihood away from certain people based upon their content, which is a form of censorship. It's, it's more of a financial censorship. So you can't produce your content without that ad in there? For free, let's say. I, I think one of the big problems, I, 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 will, I will say, I think we fell into the demonetization discussion because I, was, I just pointed that out that's where we ended up. I personally don't think demonetization is as big a deal as everyone uh, makes it out to be. 
it is an issue because there are a lot of people who don't essentially know how to run, uh, how to monetize outside of the fact that YouTube runs ads on your account. And one of the ways to silence somebody is to strip them of their resources and then eventually they'll disappear. And then they can say, oh, we never censored them, just advertisers didn't want to be on their, on their content. Well, that's actually, I can say uh, legitimately for the, for, for the most part, that's not true. You know, I've, I've had videos that have been demonetized where people hit me up on email saying, we'd love to sponsor this video. So what made YouTube decide my, that advertisers wouldn't want to be on my video? When an advertiser goes in the network and says, I want to spend $1,000 on my commercial, they'll check a little box saying no controversial videos. So there's a, a, a series of, of selections they can choose from, in which case YouTube will arbitrarily decide, I believe arbitrarily, that my videos or someone else's videos should be in those categories even if they don't fit. And then you end up, you know, lacking resources. So what I'm really curious about is when it comes to these uh, NGOs that have been pressuring uh, companies like Google to uh, censor certain things, how much of this is about the money as far as having an organization that has to justify its own existence? And how much is it about a certain idea of what's right and what's wrong and trying to suppress something people believe should be suppressed? Oh, and by the way, before I uh, uh, ask that, I would like to present our final panelists for this evening, the wonderful, and I know you don't like that word, Lionel, but it really applies to this gentleman here, Daniel Pinchbeck. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Sticks, I would be especially interested in you talking with Daniel as well, because both of you guys are in the uh, mystic, uh, mystic realms. So, but anyway, the question that I was just uh, asking the panel was about the intention, let's not even just say NGO, NGOs, but of people in general, people who believe that it's right to censor and suppress and divide for the greater good. Like, uh, Lionel, where do you see the starting from and where do you see that going? Censorship, you asked a great question. Let me see if I can translate. Are you bitching and moaning about making money? Or is it about having your content and your thoughts and ideas completely quashed and removed? The answer is yes, all of the above. You can also be shelled. You can be shadow banned. You can be removed. You can have views drop. You can say, as has been the case, as Mr. O'Keefe and others have uh, shown us, that there are ways to have people not know that they're in a form of video or platform Siberia. And it is absolutely, without a doubt, coming at every level, at every from YouTube, you name it, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, Facebook, I know nobody cares about Facebook, but it is now being called community standards or you've been bullied or you've been banned. And what I believe is it's frankly, it's a slow and gradual habituation to see how much will you take. I'm in time out. I'm off today. They shut me down for 24 hours. And people just go, okay, sorry, sorry. like we're just, where would you sheep that just take this because people say well after all nobody you don't have a right to this you don't have a right to, that's where this is you don't have a right to facebook instagram whatever it is start your own be a mind this isn't the government and the worst part about it is not so much this but the number of people that i know who are completely you know, just oblivious to it and who don't care they're nation they're bored they're there well you know whatever it is it's that social thing. So that's the problem too. Inaction as well as action. Sticks, what do you think? I think that ultimately the NGOs don't really care about money. It's not it's not so much about any sort of income for them. It's really about suppressing opinions that they don't like. I think they're mostly though working on behalf of other third parties. What I've said, what I think is happening. If we look, for instance, at the attacks on even, you know, you would think of, of, of corporate groups, essentially, Infowars. It is a business, fundamentally. It may be one that's entertaining. It's not the same as CNN, but it is a, a for-profit, multi-million dollar business. We have a strange situation now where nobody bats an eye at the fact that CNN would come out, do a write-up, an expose, so-called, on Alex Jones or on Infowars and say, oh, uh, we're encouraging YouTube to kick them off the platform. We got this video struck down, haha. -ha. Here's we submitted some others that were similar. Uh, you, you know, you understand what the actual goal is. It, and for them, it's about money. For them, it's hey, there's a competitor on YouTube who has more support, more grassroots support than we do. We CNN in this fight. We want to kick them off. The NGOs are just sort of a tool, I think, at that point. 
Now, one that has managed to get in with YouTube, convince them that they're noble, or convince them possibly behind closed doors, hey, if you don't work with us, we're going to get your platform screwed uh, because we have power. We can label you a haven for bigots. We can keep talking about this non-existent army of skinheads that supposedly is using YouTube uh, to really coerce people. I saw earlier the main man for Right Wing Watch, Jared Holt, uh, was uh, sharing out an article. And this was very funny to me. Uh, this is something that needs to be said. I was going to speak about it in a video, but here's as good a place as any. He's sharing out an article that says, oh, the alt-right, you know, the, the boogeyman, really, of modern culture is collapsing. And I thought to myself, if, if the extremists, so-called, according to him, are collapsing, then why exactly do we need more censorship on these websites? Because I'm getting a totally different story. The ADL is telling me that extremism is on the rise, already prevalent and that it's basically being sheltered by these online sites. I haven't seen that as a YouTuber, as a content creator. I simply don't see, I suppose, what they're seeing, but I think ultimately it's in partnership with groups within the old guard, the corporate media, because they're being outcompeted by people like everybody on this panel tonight. I, I have to disagree with some of that. So I used to be a director at various nonprofits dealing with fundraising, and I can tell you the moment that I decided I, I probably wouldn't do this anymore. I, I can't name the, the, the company because I'll probably get sued to oblivion. But it was around the time the Deepwater Horizon disaster happened. And they wanted us to fundraise, and they wrote us a pitch that was a total lie. They were lying about the scale of the disaster. They were lying about the amount of crew being poured to the ocean. And I said, why? You don't, you don't need to lie. Why, why would you expect me to lie to our, our, our potential donors? And that did not sit very well with them. <laughs> When I look at these companies that are in the Trusted Flagger program, you know, I think most notably we have the Southern Poverty Law Center and the Anti-Defamation League, they need to justify their existence. When their job is done, they stop, they go away. But that's not what's happening. They keep saying it's getting worse and you need to donate. Because if they tell you that extremism is going down, they tell you that you don't need us to police YouTube, then why would anyone give them money? They'd be out of a job. As far as uh, Daniel uh, Hugo, I know that, uh, for example, with Graham Hancock, there were various instances of people in the mainstream of archaeology completely dismissing his views. And the uh, things that you were able to witness in your lifetime, I think, speak to a deeper understanding of what exactly is going on on this planet. Would you also say that there is a uh, censorship going on, whether it's various NGOs or just people who like being in the position that they are to keep things a certain way, a certain style? So I, I kind of feel that I've jumped into a discourse, and I'm still trying to figure out how I like resonate with the whole the whole discourse. Um, as, as far as YouTube censorship goes, yeah. I wouldn't really say you've ever been censored. Uh, I mean, um, um, it, it just like a huge number of different issues were suddenly brought up. I'm not sure which one to address, but um, uh, I mean, you know, there's there's a paradigm. There's like a mainstream paradigm that's somebody challenges it, you know, they're going to get censored in certain respects. I mean, like Graham Hancock and Rupert Sheldrake did, a, did TEDx talks of talks that were taken down from the you know, the TED site um, because they had problems with, they felt that they weren't, uh, you know, scientific in, in terms of their definitions. I don't, I don't think it's always, you know, conspiratorial. I, I feel that's kind of like, you know, an outsider perspective maybe that things are happening, you know, very nefarious, you know, means and so on. I mean, you know, I, I think I think instance, Facebook, you know, has evolved started by kids 20, you know, 15 years ago. It's evolved in a certain way. They're they're trying to figure things out. Um, I'm not sure it's as nefarious as or, or much of a plot, you know, in a sense. Um, and um, and then yeah, but I do think we have a problem, you know, big problem with um, hate speech, you know, with um, you know um, sort of neo-Nazi speech, I mean, you know, and I'm not sure where I stand, I might mean, have a different perspective, I think sometimes there is certain types of speech which isn't really helpful to the public, you know, like, um, you know, Richard Spencer saying that maybe we need another genocide against African Americans, I, I don't really know if I consider that to be speech that should be protected to, to, to be in the public domain, or, or maybe there are reasons why Germany, like after the Nazi era, had, had to not allow certain types of discourse, you know? Well, if we have two roads that we could go on, either banning it or not banning it, uh, Bill, I'd be interested in what you think. And also, uh, Sticks, you've had a big experience with this as well, as far as uh, being able to talk with 
some of uh, some of these kinds of people. Where do you think the road would lead if we do outright ban and censor things that are as horrible as we can ever imagine? Well, when Lev and I were getting dinner, he used a really good word for it, which was fermentation of bad ideas happens when you ban them, generally speaking. That, okay, you ban them from the mainstream, you sort of out of sight, out of mind, but where, where they go, they're not going away. They're actually going to find their own little rat hole on the internet and just fester and, and do their thing. So, you know, useful speech is different from free speech, I think. And, you know, social consensus on you know, what is useful, that, that's different from the law. When, I think one important thing about free speech is uh, when I see these deep platformings, you know, uh, recently Sargon of Akkad, who was a YouTuber, had a bunch of anti-fascist protesters come in and shut the event down. When you shut the events down and you don't allow these people to speak, they will find the little red corner of the internet, they will find the little hole somewhere in the wall, and there will be no one to challenge them. And that means when they, when they do convince someone to come in and sit down and hear what they have to say, they're only going to hear good things. And that person's going to be like, wow, all of this makes sense, and I believe it. When you create an open forum with real debate, you can have someone say, here's why they're wrong, and I can prove it, and that creates useful speech. Oh. Eleanor, what do you think? Uh, there are so many thoughts going around my head right now. Um, where to start? I think that uh, it, it, prohibition has never um, helped the U.S. I mean, you can look at anything, it's something as, as seemingly trivial compared to the rise of fascism as, uh, as pro uh, the prohibition of alcohol. Um, and that led to the mafia, and it led to you know the, the uh, installation of gangs in a lot of major cities. But I think uh, instead of looking at it like uh, just sort of like this black and white situation, I think it also helps to ask the question. And I don't pretend to have the answer to this, but also to ask the question like, what do we want our social media platforms to be? Do we want them to be an exact representation of like a street corner where anybody can go and say anything that they want? Because I think it's important to note that. Social media platforms are not, they're, they, they don't have the same restrictions or freedoms that a street corner does. So, for example, uh, in the book uh, Corporations Are Not People, the author talks about like how uh, Philip Morris argued that, oh, well, a, a smoking ad is just like a, a it's not, it, it's just like free speech. It's just like a person standing on the street corner telling people that he really enjoys smoking. But that's not true. Uh, because that's not subject to somebody walking up to that person and saying, hey, this is really messed up that you feel this way, let's you know, talk about it. A social media platform, as I'm sure most a lot of you could attest to, it doesn't have that real life feeling. I mean, I get trolled so often on social media, but I get trolled so infrequently in real life because you have this freedom to be horrible online that a lot of people don't take that freedom offline. That's not to say that I think that everybody who trolls me should be banned from the internet. That would be absurd. But I think that we should take things like threats and we should take things like calls to genocide entire peoples. I think we should take that very seriously and ask ourselves, what do we want our social media platforms to be? And particularly like in this, in this moment of the, the rise of anti-intellectualism, the rise of these far-right extremist groups, uh, do we want our social media platforms to be open to them? I, and I'm not saying I have the answer. I think it's a very difficult question to grapple with. But I think it's worth contemplating, like, how do we want our social media platforms to look in regards to how free speech looks in the real world? And ask that question, like, just because these people have free speech, you know, in the real world, does that mean that we have to be the platform for them? Because free speech, for example, doesn't apply if somebody walks into my apartment and starts shrieking at me. That's not free speech. But outside on the sidewalk, that's free speech. I think it's that sort of question that needs to be grappled with in terms of the, the online experience. We can <clears throat> divide this up into different issues. First of all, we, we can talk about in terms of uh, you know, protocol. Obviously, it's social media, which is it's almost an oxymoron, because we think about what you can and can't say. But obviously, you, you shouldn't be able to, to abuse people. That's not what we're talking about. There's got to be some kind of something. Here, for example, you got to wear a jacket. No, no shirt, no shoes, no service. We're used to that. The issue is that when Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, as seemingly eh, innocent and cute as they are, but people who, for example, just spend their days taking pictures of their sleeping dogs or whatever it is, this happens to be the source of news for 90% of America. Now, all of a sudden, this little cute little social media 
turns into a utility in my view. It's bigger than anything. This is where people get their news. Now, it's one thing to say, you can't curse, you can't pose child pornography. Yeah, we know that. But if all of a sudden you're posting something or you're finding that you're not getting the news that you thought you should be because Facebook or whatever are throttling or shutting it down, that's a different issue. Very quickly, 25, 30 years ago, there was this idea called hate crimes. And hate crimes, we love the idea. It should be his oxymoron. I don't know about love crimes or something. Means, but anyway, but years ago, there was a thing called hate crimes. It was the idea of taking something that is already cognizable at law, let's say battery, hitting somebody is against the law. But if I take why you hit somebody, why? Because you don't like Alsatians, or you don't like you know, black people, right? And I take that and I pair a constitutionally protected idea of hate, because you can hate all you want, just don't act on it. All of a sudden, I'm now elevating, I'm penalizing somebody for what they thought. It also makes me difficult for the prosecutor because now I've got to prove, in addition to intent, why you did something. It was a mess. Horrible. Every prosecutor hated that. But society loved it. And with that came the idea of confusing that which we as a society hate, loathe and eschew, and, 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 and want what to get rid of in terms of hate and genocide and all that, with governmental or quasi governmental banning of the ability, and what falls under the category of hate. What does that mean? Once you okay a limitation, I'm going to get around it. And I'm going to limit your speech by using your rule, which you started with the, the greatest of intentions. I'm Mr. Gregorio. I'm your worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and if you got here with well, time, you would know that. But it was final. I never yeah. assumed they would start so early. So we're moving to get out of the work until like 6 30 or something. The final and what's yeah. your background? <clears throat> Pardon me? What do you, what, what Legal you and media analyst. I'm a lawyer. And, uh, okay, cool. Me? I'm a, I'm a writer. I've written a few books. I wrote a book called Breaking Up in the Head on Psychedelic Shamanism, and uh, most recently a book called How Soon Is Now, which he's actually carrying right over here. Which is looking at the ecological crisis we're facing as a kind of rite of passage for humanity and trying to envision like a solution path uh, beyond the cul de sac. Um, yeah, I guess like one thing that I really feel strongly is that there's no such thing as a neutral platform, just as there's no such thing as objective journalism. So I think just by creating an interface and design in a way that people you know, interact with content, you're already making so many choices about, about how people, you know, what information they're getting. I mean, even the fact that we get our information in rectangles rather than circles or bubbles is, is a choice that formats our thinking in a certain way. You know, so um, so I think that people who you know run these types of platforms like Minds need to be thinking in the, in the fact that they're already creating a medium that has a perspective. Uh, there isn't really such a thing as neutrality or objectivity, as quantum physics tells us, and so on. I, I so I can put your thumbs down and most simply. I am uh, um, Tim Wolf, a journalist. Okay, cool. What are you writing for? Uh, I am a video journalist, so okay. I uh, work for Vice for Fusion. Okay. No, I'm um, I don't want to get too much into it, but there is objective journalism, and people often yeah, confuse. I'm sorry, but how could there be objective journalism without objective anything? Because you're confusing omniscience with objectivity, right? Okay, so. so I'll give you an example. If I was to report on what you know, two people in the back of the room were doing, I don't know any of them, and I would say guy A threw a piece of paper at guy B. I'm objectively telling you what I saw. That happened. A guy threw something, right? Well, I mean, that's what you're choosing to isolate of everything else that's happening. Well, so, so, so certainly, if, if there's two guys in the street, and I'm standing across the street, and someone punches the other guy, I can tell you objectively, that guy punched that guy. Yeah, but that's what you're choosing objectively. You're choosing if someone asks me what happened, if, yeah. someone, if someone said what happened, I say that guy punched and that you guy. You might also say that there was like this newspaper blowing in the gutter. You know, and and so, the choice of the right, infinite so range of things objectivity, to say that something is important. So objectivity and reporting. Decision. See, that's that, we're, not, we're talking, you're arguing omniscience, right? Obviously, I'm not going to stand in the street corner and just know everything. But if I'm in a place and I'm looking at a group of people and I see someone do something and someone asks me what I saw, I can objectively say, I don't know what those people are. Now, if one of those people happened to be like a friend of mine, that's not objective. So there's a difference there. But I, I, I don't want to get too much in this because we're not on a journalism panel. But I do want to mention one interesting thing you brought up that I think Bill absolutely needs to pay attention to is that if, if it is true, that the right is targeted more by censorship on these platforms, which I'm not saying it is, then the, at least the perception is among the right. So what happens is they flock to alternative platforms. You, you then, uh, as, as you were just saying, the platforms aren't neutral, not in the sense that they can't be, but you're going to get more of one kind of person coming to your platform 
And then how do you prevent that platform from just, or just being a platform for their politics? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, censorship is happening to both the right and left. It seems a little bit more tipped towards the right, but I mean, LGBTQ, Wired did a really interesting piece about LGBTQ censorship on Facebook for, you know, whatever it is, nipples, certain language. So it, it's affecting the whole spectrum, but I mean, yeah, it, uh, is, I think as long as we're guiding the conversation to where to this, that's, that is not pure neutrality. We're, we're having this conversation. We're, we're not just letting it happen without talking about it. That's a huge conundrum, because I, 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 I'm sure YouTube would say we're guiding the conversation. We want to make sure the racists start, you know, flourishing. It's a challenge. I guess the, the question is like, how do you guide the conversation without creating the sort of filter bubbles that Facebook has created? Where like, if I'm you know, if I Google something and you Google the same exact thing, we'll get two different results. We'll get two different pages of results. And it's the same thing if I log on to Facebook and I have and Facebook knows that I predominantly look at uh, you know environmental justice pages. It'll show me those predominantly. But even if my mom follows the same pages, but she's more interested in, in dancing, but she'll see the dancing. So it's like, how do you guide the conversation without restricting it and, and creating these sort of filter bubbles that are basically just echo chambers? Well, that's why the chronological unrestricted newsfeed is essential by default. I mean, that is actually an example of technical neutrality that is really important so as not to create those bubbles and let people continue to reach their audiences on Facebook and Google, you know, you're reaching 3% organically now, so. But do you think people will automatically start filtering certain things out of their feed that they don't want to see and go back into those uh, bubbles? Like, Boost breaks the bubble. There's, so we like, well, you can opt out of Boost if you want. I mean, ultimately, look, you're going to create your experience and we think users, can you say a little bit about Boost just so everybody knows? Users deserve to control what they're seeing. I mean, just having algorithms dictate your daily flow of information is ridiculous. Like, you should subscribe if you want to subscribe to unsubscribe from them if you don't want to see them. Um, boost is a system where you can boost your posts based on uh, your, the amount of currency that you have and you can get more views on it and boost show up every once in a while on your feed and that's sort of how the network is driven. But um, you know you don't know what those boosts are going to be, so that's a good bubble popper. Mm. And then you know the other tools are just listening to conversations, trying to subscribe to people you disagree with. I don't know. You have to. There comes a point where education matters. You have to educate yourself. Phil, here's a question for you. What would be a way that you could create metrics around whether mine's was having a positive or negative impact on people's capacity for me? Uh, maybe, maybe we could run a secret experiment like uh, Facebook did, where they measured people's moods and they injected either happy or sad content and then looked at their posts and reactions. And yeah, they figured out that they could dictate people's happiness levels. And it was so now experiments like that. You're jumping to a negative, but I'm trying no, to but, no, I know. Potentially, that could be positive, but it would have to be totally by the consent of the user, obviously, mm -hmm. and all of the data would have to be totally public. So you would, I mean, it could happen in a transparent way, I guess. I'm also wondering if there's a way, because I, I feel like one of the things that gets lost on social media is the ability to change your mind, or, the, or even like being asked to change your mind that's not also coupled with the death threat. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way for a place of minds to say like, hey, this is, you know, like on Facebook, we have like the, the, the ridiculous like recommended for you. Um, but if there was an actual way to make a recommended for you that was outside of the purview of your typical pages that you follow, and it was like, so like I might get something that was uh, more like not as, as left as I am on the political spectrum and I could read it and be like, oh, well, that has some interesting points. And that way I'm going to it. I'm not getting it thrown in my face by someone who's angry, uh, and yet at the same time, that's a, a way to get outside of the filter bubble. Um, yeah, maybe. that's a good, good suggestion. Sticks, as far as getting people out of their bubbles, that's one thing I would like to ask you, but also uh, the conversation about uh, talking with uh, people who most people would not approve of that much, and how that actually. Uh, stops uh, the fermentation that uh, Bill was referring to me referring to before when we were having dinner. Well, those two things really go hand in hand because the best way, if you're talking about social media, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, whatever, I think, this is just my feeling, 
the best way to challenge someone's echo chamber to prevent them from becoming, you know, too fanatic, maybe they get violent, or they're just, they just remain ignorant of reality, perhaps, is to challenge their views by not creating an echo chamber in the public space in the first place. I think the biggest problem that we're seeing emerge on YouTube isn't even so much, the, you know, the rules as the, the discerning behavior of the moderation staff and the algorithms. I think what's happened is that they're confusing vagary uh, with the ability to just uh, use a little bit of discretion in how they apply the rules. So we've got limited state. Limited state is applied to a video that does not actually break the rules, but it comes close to breaking the rules. The final decision on whether your video should go in that category is made by a perfectly fallible, potentially biased human being. I think that the biggest problem is if you're you're worried about extremists, you're worried about fanatics, zealots, whatever, those people, you're worried fundamentally about them having an extreme bias. How do you then fix for the fact that some of the people policing that behavior may themselves have similar degrees of bias? I think that's becoming a big problem. Uh, I think Facebook is becoming irrelevant at this point, so I'm not sure why even bother talking about it. It's dying as a platform. None of the, the new kids, so to speak, use it. People from my generation, of course, we're, we're gravitating away. We're using Minds or Gab or something like that. Nobody cares about Zuckerberg's synth experiments anymore in the Institute. Uh, but definitely, you've gotten to the point where you've got people being chased into echo chambers and you can go to them. But I think people should be able to go to an extremist echo chamber as long as they're not like plotting terrorism or something. But in the public forum, as long as you have a company, uh, I, I understand uh, what's being said here uh, in the sense of a company or a, a site cannot be fully unbiased. I would acknowledge that that's the case. Therefore, their bias should be towards, hey, we're going to take a hands-off approach and let the user base actually sort of decide how things go as far as news goes. Challenging people's echo chamber is great, but at the same time, if they don't want to be challenged, ultimately, there's not a whole lot you can do other than, than uh, put material out there that's interesting, hopefully, and smart, uh, that's been uh, independently produced that can actually get that accomplished. Because a company, companies are totally inept when it comes to marketing, I think, things like that. I'd like to, uh, but I get to the next opportunity if you want to get, but I, I'd like to maybe provide or offer a, like a philosophical context for the thinking about the discussion from a different angle. I've been studying this book recently, but do people know Ken Wilber? Yeah. Uh, tech World Theory, and he has a new book out called Trump and the Post Truth World. Uh, for me, it was really, really clarifying and really helpful. So, Wilber's whole idea is a spinal dynamics model, which argues that there is an evolution of consciousness that happens through people kind of reaching um, more encompassing perspectives. You know, so, you know, in the, way, in the way we view even in an individual lifespan from childhood to adulthood. So people start out with maybe self-interest, then they have interest in their family or their, their local community or their ethnic identity or their national identity. And then these are different memes that he assigns different colors to. He believes that since the 1960s, the, the leading edge of consciousness on the planet has been what he calls the green, the green meme. And about 20% of, of the population in the U.S., he argues, is, 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 around, is in this green leading edge. And it's, um, you know, postmodern, he characterizes as pluralistic, um, world-centric, no longer out of this idea of ethnic identities, believing that everybody has a right to, you know, live and prosper and so on. Um, but but, but, as, but as that, as, as that uh, form of consciousness has become predominant, its negative polarities have also become more uh, evident. And what those are is if you don't believe, if you, if you believe that everybody is equal, then, then it, the, the, the negative aspect is there's no, there's no privileged position. You know, there's also no truth, so it collapses into relativism. Uh, uh, Ken Wilber calls it aperspectival madness. And so, um, as, and so deconstruction is an example of this. It's like, yeah, there's no truth, there's no privileged position, and so on. And, and so what's that, what, what that's caused is opened a gap uh, that allowed for this Trump nightmare to happen. Uh, because when there's no truth, and you could say, oh, it's all fake news, it's only bias, and so on. And, and so now we're in a world where, uh, yeah, we can't establish a better, a, a, what's better than something else as a worldview. And, and, and Wilbur says that actually we have to recognize, I mean, the, the, this pluralistic postmodern worldview is against hierarchies. But, you, but instead of hierarchies, he proposes we think of, of what he talks about as growth holarchies. 
that actually there is an actual evolution from ethnocentric identity to kind of planet, you know, planet-centric or even cosmocentric identity, and and, and therefore there, there is there, that is an advantage, an, an advance. Like it is better to not be trapped in an ethnic identity or to identify as a fascist who doesn't like black people or Jews or whatever, you know. And and, and so yeah, you know, in, in that sense, I think you know media should have a function, you know, conscious media should have a function of trying to help lead humanity away from these, you know, sort of atavistic identities that are actually causing so much strife on the planet by helping them understand an ecological and holistic perspective. And that, that's what I would personally prefer to see something like mine. It's not necessarily about negating these other worldviews, but, you know, but, but figuring out a way to, um, I don't know, to, to, to diminish their, their hold on people's psychologies. Because they have a kind of negativity, has a kind of hypnotic uh, thrall on people, and catches them in a kind of fascination loop, uh, which then leads to things like school shootings and uh, you know racist uprisings and so on. That's a very fascinating observation, and I'd be interested in what everybody thinks, but i actually like to start with Sticks. What, Sticks, what do you think about uh, what Daniel just said right now? I think that there's, if you have that deconstructivist view and you don't believe maybe in an objective right or wrong and you're going from nearly the pragmatic, look around at the world today and the results of multiculturalism and censorship, they're not positive. The problem is there will always be a misapplication of any censorship, no matter how benevolent a certain person or group may be in trying to, in trying to establish it. I really don't feel like you really heard what I said. I don't really feel you're answering what I had to say. I mean, you're answering something else, which is okay. But I wasn't, it doesn't really feel like it answers what I was trying to uh, express there. I mean, I don't know if what's, the, what's the central point then, in, that, in a uh, nutshell? Constructive postmodern relativistic worldview is actually something to, to, to acknowledge and also to transcend, but, but not to then say there's no hierarchy. I mean, you can say there's no hierarchy, but there, but there is an evolutionary trajectory, which is towards more inclusion and, and recognizing a kind of holistic, ultimately a holistic understanding that we are all one species connected to the planet we, we, we you know we have an interconnected as a responsibility for the whole like that that's the trajectory we need to go with right yeah so, six. I, I would i would i would disagree with that myself i think it's important to keep in mind differences between individuals and groups for the purposes of governing one's life ultimately though but 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 let's go for, going a little bit further Let's assume that you say that that's it's utopian, it's good, it's it's positive. You can't force other people to take part in it. How does that have anything to do with maybe tech firms or journalists attempting to coerce people? It just gives, it, trust me, it gives more ammunition to people like myself who are looking for an excuse to attack the corporate media because the corporate media and every other aspect, you're, you're essentially saying groups like maybe a CNN or whatever, I'm not sure, should, despite the fact that they, they tried to promulgate war, they themselves exploit hate. They try to uh, use wedge issues, people's differences, to cause them to be at each other's throats so they can sensationalize and make money. Despite that fact, you would want them to be like the moral guardians of the universe. Uh, I think that's uh, a terrible idea. Of course, how do you get that perspective? That's totally not anything that I have to say. I think what uh, Daniel was trying to say, okay, I, th I think I could be the mediator here, I'm, perhaps. I'm really not, I mean, I'm not a fan of corporate media, but I, mean, I do think that, you know, in this collapse into the negative pole of the green meme that Ken Wilber talks about, which sticks, I have to say, is exactly from my perspective where you're anchored right now, um, you know, um, when there's such a rejection of evidence-based journalism, and, you know, I've written for the New York Times, and I don't like the New York Times. I, they're infiltrated by the CIA. There's no doubt. You can go back to their history, how they promoted the Iraq War, and yada yada. But you know, when you write for them, there is a, a bedrock of, of journalism and fact checking. You know, which is impressive. You know, which you don't find in a lot of the other. Yeah, like every every quote yeah. is checked. Every fact is checked. It's just checked. It just yes. Yeah, not true. No. I, 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 I that's, that's, that's totally wrong. wrong. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm talking about the New York Times. Right. Right. So, so and, and I'm not saying that they're a paragon. <laughs> I don't like corporate media. I'm not a paragon of, of corporate media. I'm saying there are standards that, that that actually have meaning and value that should be then brought into this you know alternative realm rather than this kind of like. Um, Kind of like what's developing is this sense of like a total kind of vapid relativism where there's no there's there's no point of view that's of more value than any other point of view, which isn't going to help us as a, as a species to collapse into the miasma that we're already collapsing into.
who decides which point of view is the right one? Well, that's why I gave you Wilbur's perspective, and I recommend a few of his books. I mean, he's not even my, my favorite thinker, but I think in this in this you know circumstance, he's very useful because there is an evolutionary trajectory, and there are point of views that are more encompassing, more humane, and actually better. You know, to, to, to care about you know the earth and the future of humanity is better than collapsing into an ethnospheric racist or some similar type of identity, which is separatist and won't allow us to grow past this point. Well, Daniel, if, for example, in the Kabbalah, we have the idea of the spirit world, which is always giving off something, while we're always receiving something. If, in the end, we're all supposed to become as one and be able to telepathically communicate with each other, which I think is going to happen in the future, in the world that we're stuck in right now, we're still going to be full of selfish people who are going to be misusing emotions and emotionally volatile people for their own ends. And that's going to be a big problem when it comes to how do we know what the right decision is. So sh how, how careful should we be, uh, be when it comes to, okay, I'm going to do this because it feels really, really good, because it feels really nice and righteous and noble, and how could that be misused against us? Can I propose a litmus test in that, that for a, a couple months ago there were millions of views going to videos of children that were force feeding other children feces, children in bathtubs with feces and blood in it. That's really weird, horrible. creepy stuff. And, and the, the Spider Man costume was put on guys that were beating. Oh, yeah, you're talking about Elsa Gate. Elsa Gate, yes. yeah. And if you'll notice, a lot of people who were recently banned were people who were very critical of those videos and the mm -hmm. fact that they were being suggested somehow by the algorithm for children. And those people, like like Titus Frost, got, got banned. He got thrown off. He was very critical of the what he was calling the kind of pedophile videos. And I think that maybe also destroyed the illusion also. He got kicked off. And so I actually have, like, I haven't followed this stuff, so I have no idea what you're talking about. But I do think you need to be careful about what you allow your own mind to dwell in, like dwelling in something that's that grotesque. Um, there were millions of views. I mean, okay. really big. This is actually really interesting, and I think it's great you brought it up, because Elsa Gate is what happens when there is no oversight. Exactly. What, what happened was, for those that don't know, uh, the YouTube algorithm, when somebody watches a video for a long period of time, YouTube says, these, the words in the title, the words in the description and tags, must be good things. And so parents will turn YouTube on and hand it to their baby. The baby doesn't touch anything, sometimes might mash the keyboard. And so YouTube autoplays based on the video, and it goes down this weird, it's kind of like a, what's that deep image search thing Google did where pictures are getting really weird. Someone makes a video of Elsa singing from Frozen, and then someone else makes a video dressed up as Elsa. Eventually, you really did end up with, I, I, it's hard to say, but depictions of children eating feces simply because the algorithm worked. And people, they, they were bots producing content, they were human beings who said, hey, this is what works and makes us money and gets you know a million views, I'm gonna make it. And some of these high profile users were banned. That's what happens when there is no guiding force. Then we have the other problem. When someone determines, you know, a small group of people or individual, what should be, then they start censoring content saying your ideas aren't good and shouldn't be on the platform, and you start losing legitimate conversation. So those are the two extremes. Mm -hmm. Don't you want a transcript of tonight's show? <laughs> this is fantastic. May I ask a very simple question? This happened recently. Let's say you're on Twitter, just a regular person, and you say, you know what? I think these people in Florida, these students, I think they're crisis actors. I don't think, not that there wasn't a shooting, but I think they're paid, or I don't like them, or I, whatever, and you enter this, upload it, and all of a sudden they shut your account down because you're Facebook does the same thing. You can't say that. People say, yes. And there's a sense of how dare you. And then YouTube does it. Now, here's the question. Is that okay? Is it just nah, it's Twitter? It's not like it's a free speech violation. It's no big deal. They've got their rules. Start up your own Twitter. Anybody see a problem with that? Because that happens all the time. Very, very simply. Or you will write something for whatever reason. You didn't phrase it correctly. We're not talking about infantile caprophagia. Nothing even that gross. Pretty simple. I don't think this is real. Or I think it might have been a period of history, a particular story that didn't occur. I'm a revisionist. I don't believe it. It's my opinion. Nothing profane. I've got four followers. No big deal. They shut my account. Do I have any repercussions? Do I have any right? Or is that just the way it is? Because that's the issue. Somebody doesn't like your opinion. It's not the government. You're not being arrested. You're just shut down from your 
Twitter. What right do you have to just say things in the public domain? I, I'd like to point out why that's a, a bigger problem than just having an opinion. Uh, not too long ago, after the Florida incident happened, the Associated Press reported that a white nationalist took credit, saying that the shooter trained his camps. A little bit of research and you'd find out that it was likely a hoax perpetrated by users on the Discord platform who were trying to just trick the media. The Associated Press reported as fact. They cited the Anti-Defamation League, who cited 4chan as fact, which was surprising to me. Several different news outlets then sourced the AP, saying it was all true. I made a video that day where I said, this is likely a hoax. This is, and I showed uh, some clips of why it was likely hoax. I can't say definitively, but we know these people were attempting to do this for some time. And citing 4chan as fact is not a good idea. And who is this guy claiming he was actually, uh, actually had this kid in his camp anyway? This is not confirmed. YouTube took my video down and issued a community guideline strike, saying that I was harassing and bullying, presumably the white nationalists, which was shocking to me. <laughs> the next day, the Associated Press issued a correction. Yes, they shouldn't have sourced the Anti-Defamation League who found some random guy on the internet. And at, a day later, YouTube brought my video back, <coughs> no word, no apology, no correction. So what happens when someone at YouTube or on another platform decides, you know what, you're probably wrong because a, a large corporate news entity says, you know, disagrees with you. Well, then there's going to come a time when a legitimate story comes out. I, I think a lot of these conspiracy theories are are crazy. I mean, they, they're, they're, but they're real conspiracy theories. We know that they, But what they, right do you have to YouTube? Let's assume everything you're saying is exactly correct. You're, you just expressed something and somebody overreacted or not. What right do we have to express speech on social content? It's a very simple question. Is there a right or is that just the way it goes? Start well, your own. Whether or not it's a right or not, I didn't violate any of their guidelines. That was a false strike. And if you are unfairly taken down, what? That's the issue. There's the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Any of you in the oh, sure. yeah, yeah. right. John Terry Barlow, for I know, I mean, these are guys that really started in 1990, which was the beginning of this discussion was it's evolved like six different times. It used to be, I mean, are you are you in touch with people like that? Are you talking to these people? These are people who can take your case to the court. There's also something about trust that's going on. It used to be in my youth, when I was your age, that we had certain newspapers and television channels that we watched, each one bearing a certain kind of point of view. We knew when we read the editorial of the Wall Street Journal, which still today is very conservative. We knew that we read the rest of the paper, it was just journalistic news, holistic, they were afraid of the op-ed people, in fact. But uh, if you read uh, you know, the post, you get a, you know, you know what you're getting. Anyway, so you knew if you read the Christian Science Monitor or you read the Harlem newspaper, you, were, you knew what you were reading and you bought it for that reason. And if you were a, a journalist, you were reading all those papers to get all the points of view. You're talking about this bubble. What's happening here is that every single one of you multiplied by how many in an infinite, has the infinite number, all have an opinion. And you're smart, so you're sitting here, and I enjoy listening to you. But there are a lot of dumbasses out there who are putting these stupid things with the children eating God knows what on and on. And, and you know what? I am suddenly handing that to a child, or I, because of an algorithm. But that's your fault. No, 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 no. It is my fault. But so what? The no, question no, is, you can't trust. go to court. You can't say, wait a minute, they took my thing out. I want to oh, call a BFF. That's, that's true. The DMCA. But what is reason, reason and rights? That's a different issue. Well, though. Rights. Right. That's so right. That's right. We're very good on Where rights. is the law? Where is it? What do you do? Do you have any right? Yes, you're right about that. What about reasonableness? Aside what from reasonableness, aside, aside from that, point aside from that, do you, you have a right to do that we should strive for? Different argument. Different argument. It's not a different argument. We're not I'm talking about it. that they should be merged. We're not talking. No, no. Yes, what I'm saying is if law, you are, okay, if you just said law, what you just said law. right now, just a and Twitter decided to shut you down, you have a microphone for let me, let me get back to this. No, 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 no,
the right to put all this this crap on the, on the air? Yes, have the right. But ha when when that idiot who likes those pictures back four years ago or twenty years ago, when none of the internet was around for me to have to see it, I don't want to see the guy putting. Part of the problem is it's the decay of our capacity to reason and act ethically as a society. It's like atrophy, I and mean, somehow the social media the system is actually accelerating that atrophication, and, and, and we don't quite know what to do with it. So let's just acknowledge that we don't quite know what to do about it. And, and I don't think that, I mean, even when you were describing it, it didn't seem to me like terrible. You know, it felt to me like there's like a system that's trying to figure out, like an immune system, how to react. So yeah, like they, you know, people report something and it's wrong, they're human, they get carried away. The next day there's a retraction, you know, they, YouTube is somehow connected to these more established forms of information brokering, and they pull it and put it back on. It doesn't seem to me, you know, catastrophic. They never put it, you know, back on, or if they took you off YouTube entirely, that would certainly be, you know, and it's, you know, it's obviously important that people are looking at this and testing the limits of it and so on. That's part of the process. I think on a deeper level, the problem is that um, we're all like alienated individuals in this. Huge society that's got out of control without any community structures. Like, I think in the past, it would be the community that would sort of hold people accountable. That would maybe, like, uh, you know, there would be some form of like, oh, like, my views have gone crazy, therefore my neighbors aren't listening to me anymore. You know, or they don't, or they're, or they're not, or they're, you know, they, nobody wants to hang out with me. Now people are going crazy in these like isolated silos, and, and they're just screaming online, and they're finding other lunatics to listen to that screaming. And unfortunately, I'm a little afraid that platforms like mine maybe help amplify that a little bit. Stace, your ears are probably uh, turning right now as uh, far as what you're going to uh, talk about. One thing that I would really like for you to address is, do you see there being a uh, shadowy catastrophe coming with this dissolution? Or do you see in the next generation, the generation that, for example, listens to you, something else sprouting, something that we may have lost? I, I would say simply that we need to determine where we're going to go as a society. Things tend towards polarization, that much is clear. We have to determine, are we going to throttle the entire internet, uh, throttle the information on it, and uh, a lot of people who create content? Now, or are we going to have more or less a free and open internet? I think Lionel was touching on something important. That is, there's a differentiation between your right, specifically and legally speaking, to use a platform like YouTube and Twitter. And I would say the pragmatic side of it, which is, should these platforms, uh, is it sane? Is it a good idea for them to engage in censorship? I still think that there's an opportunity for simply uh, grassroots support to prevent the worst aspects of censorship. It's not a case where you have to have either total lawlessness or, you know, total authoritarian nanny state YouTube. It's a case where YouTube already had rules against the kind of content that we're discussing. It was already, it already would have been determined as spam. It's just that nobody apparently, nobody wanted to touch the issue. The people that did tend to touch that issue tended to be on the fringe of YouTube, in some cases ideologically, and then they were targeted for bringing it up, probably by the same people making money off that nonsense. Meanwhile, though, we've got NGOs that fundamentally, instead of looking at tidal waves of spam, uh, uh, protecting children, protecting you know, sex trafficking, stuff like that, instead of focusing on legitimate issues on YouTube that clog up the platform or are criminal, they're worried about something that could be construed as offensive or somebody, they fired a gun and so an, an algorithm determines that it's war footage, it demonetizes it. I would say I'm in perhaps a unique position compared to many creators. I've never monetized any content. I rely upon book sales and grassroots support. I never used AdSense. I'm damn glad that I didn't. Uh, that's just a part of it though. It goes well past anything regarding money on both ends. And it goes into the realm of, of pure philosophy, which is, is it a good idea? Will the platform remain healthy? Will creators be able to make ends meet, put their stuff out there? And is it sane and moral uh, to algorithmically demote, to demonetize, to begin striking people's stuff down? I, I'm seeing some of these groups, they sit there crowing. They're like, oh, our algorithm, 83% of the time, it gets it right on hate speech, you know, whatever that amounts to according to their standards. 83%. 
So roughly one out of five times it fails and it gives somebody a strike for something that's totally innocuous. That doesn't make me sleep very well at night thinking about spending a decade. I've been on, the, on YouTube for a decade. I'm making content there. I've been on Facebook for a decade, Twitter only, I think two years now actually at this point. I'm making all this content. I have no specific guarantee that some random rogue staffer doesn't decide they don't like me and kicks me off of a platform or some algorithm gets it totally wrong and maybe I stop being able to post for a week. I mean, you know, I mean, as Lionel kind of mentioned, I mean, YouTube and Google are not public infrastructure. Also, they're private companies that, you know, and, you know, yeah, we do also have the right, you could start your own, you know, open source platform or, I mean, you know, sorry if that does happen to you unfairly or something, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, but, but, you know, these are not like, you know, these are arbitrary brokers, they're private companies well, that yeah. have taken the place of public utilities in some sense. Are they also quasi-governmental entities as well? Like, how much influence does the government have on these companies? <laughs> like giving them seed money to start? Are you getting aside from that? <laughs> well, I think it was a good point. You know, we had this way back, and he could go to, to bring this back to our, our, our constitutional forebears, and this idea of the government. But now we have this particular thing here. And now we're going to ask yourself, what about surveillance? What about surveillance and rights and privacy? And who gets to see this stuff? Who gets, again, the government loves to sit back and say, it's not us, it's Apple, or take it up with Sprint, or whoever it was. We're in this unique world right now, this weird, as you say, quasi-government, where these organizations are so big, so large, so plenary, so ubiquitous, that we're going to ask ourselves, ask courts, legislation perhaps, to ask to reconsider these people as almost being quasi-governmental. And to apply the First Amendment the same way. Because if all of a sudden, if I say, listen, we don't like your book for whatever reason, and I decide I'm Google and it's gone, in some respects, it just disappeared. And you can say, no, it's still there. You can find it. So the question is, when something is of that size and that enormity, are we going to have to regroup? And what everybody said as far as society going to hell in a handbasket, agreed 100%. We're indefinite, we're fed, and we're odious, we're hard. I understand that. <laughs> but the question I have too is when do we say, how do we ever benefit by saying no? You can't say that. And forget the extreme kids eating feces and that sort of thing, child pornography. How, when do we somehow just say, you know what, we're going to err on the side of just letting people say everything and let the community perhaps do something or with some grassroots? Although well, we also have another issue coming up, which is the deep faith I and mean, the fact that now there's not going to be any capacity. To tell if a video is real or not, so there'll be, a, there'll be a video of Obama, you know, noshing on Jewish babies or something, and it'll look just like Obama. And, and you know, but, but I mean, and, you know, you can be sure that that is going to be weaponized by you know, um, you know all sorts of you know horrible. Yeah, actually, that you know, ability is pretty well done. Oh, it's it's, it's, it's exists right there's, now. There's, yeah. I mean, this is a great discussion, but yeah. maybe supplanted by the real fake stuff that's generated by AI. Adobe also is working on a big Photoshop right now. Basically, it's a vocal version of Photoshop, and apparently, they're going to be able to emulate people's voices with the face five years. Or just the CIA that created fake editing videos. Like the Pentagon has, their, has the Pentagon has its own propaganda wing. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I'm saying it. It's another example, which is. Right. Very frightening because the, then our government uses that as evidence to perpetuate more. Well, yeah. Right. Well, well, my point good. being that that is really horrifying because they are then in control of the missiles. I mean, I can post a fake video of me eating a baby. I can't also launch missiles. So what are you guys going to do? Well, I, I have an answer. Come closer to the, the <laughs> mic if you could. I have an answer for the, right, okay. the, uh, the fake digital content that could be out there, right? One of which is, is the blockchain. Because right now, there's technology that you can timestamp anything that's created against the blockchain. So then if, if, if you create technology, which is out here, it's easy to do, where basically take a video of something and it timestamps, okay, at that time, at that location, this is what it was. And then if there's changes that, that you could always check to see, okay, well, we know that this thing was modified after it was originally made. So there's, there's a way in technology to, to deal with Fake digital content. Wouldn't that require a reporting device to be connected to the internet and has to be reported? Yeah, and they more or less are already, right? But that requires it. Uh, if it's against the blockchain, it's centralized. It no, it is. It, it just is. I mean, that's what it was designed to be. So that's that. And then I think there's not other, just one blockchain, there's many, many blockchains. There are, but I'm just. 
that's now we're talking about more details. I'm just saying, yeah, versioning the systems. There's a solution. Yeah, there's a solution. Yeah, there's a solution. Yeah, there's a solution. The other, the other thing I was want to touch on is, I think the main issue is accountability, and I think what you were referring to earlier about the trolling, right? No one trolls you like they do in real life as they do online because they don't feel that accountability, and that's why I you think that people. You probably just closed it. I, oh, he's fine. I think when we're talking about free speech or any sort of freedom to do something, uh, we're all free to do whatever, right? Now there's levels of accountability for that. I'm free to go murder somebody, but you know, if I'm caught, I go to jail, right? It's just, I'm accountable for it. If I'm not caught, I don't go to jail, but there's nothing prohibiting me from doing that. You know, and people can say and do things that are disgusting, and now we have to decide, okay, are we going to allow them to be accountable? And is it the social platform, be like Facebook or Google or this, that causes that? Or is it our society that's going to rise up and say, you know what? This, you know, even if we disagree with it, it's fine, uh, you know. But this content, because it's just objectively obscene, these people need to be accountable for. So that's what I just want to touch upon on those two issues. Before we go to Q&A, I would like to ask everybody in the panel, what do you guys think is going to be happening in the future as far as the next generation, Generation Z? What are they going to experience? Are they going to be any uh, different from uh, us as far as the way they look at the world? So I would like to uh, start uh, from uh, Daniel and just go around to the panel and uh, find out. I can't really, I don't know, but I have a daughter in high school, is that Generation Z? Yeah. Uh, I mean, they seem pretty nice so far. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm more concerned about, um, yeah, these, you know, some of these issues. I mean, I do think, like, I, I think that, um, yeah, what that man just brought up around the blockchain is interesting. That, and I, I don't think there's necessarily a technical, technological solution, except maybe we can use the blockchain to create, like, networks of trust so that people have some kind of verification that goes back to some type of source. Because with the swapping of fake news and now deep fake video, and all the, the, the alienation, atrification of civic discourse, leading to all these maniacs uh, getting all this attention, uh, we, we've got some serious problems. And, and, I, and I do hope technology can be used in, in a wiser way to uh, re resolve them. I'm just not sure that that's the case. I, I want to say something first. I think YouTube overall isn't that positive. And often we have these conversations where we just rag on the things they're doing wrong. And as much as they have done wrong, I'm grateful and I benefit greatly being on YouTube, as well as many other social platforms. So just because we bring up these issues, we want fixed, doesn't mean we, we think the platform is bad. No, it means we want to make sure it stays good. Now, as for the future, I, I, I can't make any, I, I hate making predictions, but one thing that really scares me is that either we're going to see the divide keep getting worse and worse because we're, we're to a point where people don't even want to talk to each other. You, you know, uh, we see an article where they call Sargon of Akkad right wing when he's clearly not. And that poisons the well. Now people are going to say, oh, okay, I'm not going to watch that guy's video. He's, he's the other. And if that continues and gets worse and worse and worse, then what's going to happen to the next generation? Or these kids, like every generation in the past, says the adults are really stupid. Screw you. I'm going to do my own thing. And maybe it's solved simply because they think we're all idiots. I think there is some momentum generally towards more open cooperative structures. And there's even evolutionary reasons for that, Daniel and I have talked about before. So similar to what happened with Wikipedia, Wikipedia disintermediated all those, you know, Encarta, all those encyclopedias that no one ever uses anymore. Not that Wikipedia is like the ultimate source of information, but a small open source cooperative structure is a top 10 website. So that's gonna start happening probably with money, with social media, with every, you know, probably farming, probably all different practices. So like Tim's saying, you know, these platforms are, yeah, they're useful to a degree. We're, we're on a Google AI right now. I mean, you, you have to give them credit for that to a certain degree, but the problem is that it's not free software. It's, there's written with surveillance. It's, so it's all totally nuanced, and we just have to keep building a better version of what they've created, because they're not making the moves to change it in the right direction fast enough. So we have to. It would be nice if they would just open up everything, open source everything, stop surveilling, so that we could actually stop spending our time and energy 
trying to catch up to them and build more ethical versions of what they've already created. So they're sort of, I think they're uh, putting a restriction on evolution by making everyone, like, keeping a secret session. So it's, uh, but it's inevitable. It's, we're, we're moving. Um, well, real quick to answer your question, what am I going to do about it? I'm going to keep doing what I have been doing, which is exposing that shit, since we've already cursed, I'm just going to keep going. Um, well, but that's what I work to do every day. And I would ask that everybody be more engaged. I think somebody on the panel mentioned that, like, you kind of have to ask people to do something. Like, I know that your news just comes to you, and that's really nice, but, like, we do have to be our own... Uh, our own journalists and our own critics and be able to look at something like they did it they did it a, 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 um, a survey and middle schoolers like 80% of them were not able to tell the difference between a native ad and an actual article that was real news so this is problematic and that's not to say that I think the next generation is uh, doomed I have hope but no optimism I don't think that everything's just gonna be fine because evolution uh, I think that we can make things better, but it requires a lot of work. And if we have to be willing to do that work, particularly when we have these platforms that can perpetuate bullshit just as easily and as readily as they can perpetuate actual news and the, the beautiful, beautiful ability to let somebody know what's happening thousands of miles away and outside of their purview. Um, and with that, I will also say that as an organizer and as somebody who has visited people personally, I think that despite the fact that social media platforms are brilliant, there is something to be said for in-person and face-to-face -face, uh, organizing. And I think that with regards to reaching out to extremists or people that you know post things that they hate all Jews or all black people, like I think that some of the work that needs to be done there will need to happen face-to-face -face and will need to happen uh, on the front line, so to speak, of these of these issues as well. <clears throat> um, this is the greatest thing that ever happened in my lifetime. I, I love this. For all the bad, I will take all the bad over when I grew up, which I thought was great. It wasn't really that great. We had a library. Nobody knew anything. But, you know, when, my, my question is, first of all, when uh, Generation Z have kids, what are their kids called? Anyway, just a question. <laughs> Hey, hey. There is a there there when we were kids, there was no such thing as a peanut allergy. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. And nut allergies, pre allergy. Now there's more allergies. I want this generation, because they were born in captivity, they've never known freedom, they don't know what 1984 is, they don't know who you know, Orwell is Orwellian dystopia, they don't know anything about having their limitations to their speech, their location on. I want them to have a new allergy, and that is to somebody say, you can't say that. And I want them immediately to say, whoa, whoa, who, who said that? Not what was the topic, but who said you can't say that? Don't you want to hear what the topic is? Not necessarily. Who said you can't say that? Why can't you say that? Is it the government? Is it YouTube? Is it my school? Is it, the, is it who? Who said it? Is, is this this organization? We're losing that. Because the argument is that, well, you know, that is, that, that is kind of racism. Yeah, you know, what we can, that's not the point. Because that's what you call it. Because I'm going to turn around and I'm going to call what you're saying racist as well. I want there to be an allergy towards somebody saying you can't say something. Doesn't mean it's going to be it's going to be awful. Sometimes you're going to hear every bit of dread and crap that people spew. But I would rather do that than live in a world where we're becoming more habituated to limitation of speech, but we're tolerating any kind of censorship, governmental, uh, platform, organizational. Doesn't matter. Even these laws that say you can't. Or here, here in New York. You can't have sugar. We had a sugar ban. You can't do this. And you've got to compost. We had a law in the city of New York, Operation Latch On, that came along and said women in, in hospitals, in city hospitals, if they wanted to not breastfeed, which last time I checked, was that right? We had Mayor Bloomberg who said, no, hide formula. This is the mayor of New York telling women they can't breastfeed. <laughs> We're becoming more and more habituated to being told no to stifle. That's all I want. I want them to have an allergy for being told they can't say something. That's it. Sticks? I would say that in the short term, I'm pessimistic uh, towards any given individual because what I see is a, a severe amount of suppression, a severe crackdown, not just online, but in, in culture in general. It goes towards the larger problem of what Lionel's talking about. People 
post 9-11 really, I think, really have uh, have come accustomed to the concept that they need to be ta- kept safe. And it's morphed beyond being kept safe from some vacuous uh, concept of an extremist, a physical other, uh, towards ideas itself that may themselves be extreme or labeled as such. Long term, though, over the next few years, you'd say after two or three, I'm actually very optimistic about our chances because I think the amount of growth just in the last couple of years towards people realizing that we do have a cultural problem has grown so rapidly. It's no longer just partisan. It's not just you know Euroskeptics or or a new right or something like that. It's gone beyond that into a cultural zeitgeist of sorts. Uh, and I think the reason for this is really that we're at the end of a political and social paradigm. I think if we look at what's happening in the world, that's a, a symptom of that. That's a good thing. I think it maybe it reforms the left, makes them less censorious. Maybe it reforms aspects of the right. It could be a very good thing for the world, but we've got to march through fire and hell for several years. And in that given period of time, more abuse uh, from corporations, opportunists that don't themselves care about the moral side of issue, you'd think of a Sarkeesian maybe or a Dunham, uh, they will continue to try to abuse people in order to justify, I think, their own existence. Thank you. And with that, we go to the Q&A. Whoever wants to. Tico, you want Thank the you. mic? Sure. As uh, Terrence McKenna said, uh, culture is not your friend. We, we are in a, in a deep state of um, being stealth, stuck in a cult of, of uh, deceit. And, uh, Americans, unfortunately, in most of the world, has been deceived and lied to for many decades. So pre-incident, think about it. Um, most of the corporate media um, that was happening was bombarding uh, uh, homes with images of war and uh, mayhem in Vietnam. Uh, the media lied us uh, into war against its weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq. And it's okay to show um, gore and war and bombings of innocent people uh, and later to find out that that we were lied to. So a, a lot of this dumbing down of society is perpetrated by, you know, whether it be the, the CIA mockingbird or, or governments around the world to, to strip us from the power that we have and uh, within each of us. We're all divine beings. We all have the, uh, the, the cosmic spark within us where we can elevate our consciousness and, and, and really guide the evolution of humanity without being told by these bureaucrats and control freaks and egomaniacs as to what is good for us and what is not good for us. We've been lied on, 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 on a big pharma side. And think about it, the four horsemen of the apocalypse um, or, the, or the, the, the institutions of, of, of government, of organized religions, of banking cartels, and a military industrial complex. Those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So either we grow up and, and truly take our power back as, as star seeds of consciousness, or we will diminish and, and go down a spiral of self-destruction um, on our own, being guided and controlled by these forces and, and these institutions. So my question to each of you is, how do you individually um, come into your own power, you know, um, and, and into your own community. What is it that you do to elevate the consciousness of those that you love and those in, in the community that you are part of? Thank you. I mean, I guess uh, I mean, my biggest effort in that regard was creating a company and a social network. Uh, it was a company called the Volver. It's still up, I'm just not actively involved with it anymore. But um, you know, we went back to the reality stand web, so we kind of like trying to spread ideas and be virtual paradigm. And we had a sort of a social uh, movement called the Evolvers uh, Network, and we created local community groups. We supported the creation with volunteers, and we had like 50 or 70 local groups who would do monthly events around different themes, ranging from permaculture to shamanism to local currencies, the idea of like creating nodes and alternative culture. And it was just very difficult to get funding for it. It was, um, and, and so ultimately, I think we kind of abandoned that project in a certain respect. And I'm still very sad about it because, um, yeah, it feels like 
what's happening in the U.S. is, in a way, like this all right thing is the only thing that has cultural energy in, in like, particularly in the red states. There's kind of like cultural deserts. So people are graduating to, you know, it's almost like the punk rock, you know, thing where people just graduate to the thing that's extremist that gives them some kind of voice, you know, some kind of sense of holding on to something. And we really need nodes of an alternative paradigm that, uh, you know, is more transformative, more, more communal oriented, more oriented towards everything that you just spoke about. So um, that's why that's my check. Thank you. I'm a journalist, so I, I think you know I make a, a video every day about some prominent issue, and then uh, every so often I try to, as much as possible, travel around the world and go on the ground to actually explore experience and then share what is, is happening, at least from my personal point of view, and looking at statistics, talking with people, and then hopefully, you know, I, I used to work in nonprofits, as I mentioned before, and that's a soul-crushing job. They, a lot of people think nonprofits sound so great. But when you're working in fundraising, what really happens is you start to just, you know, people become numbers, they become donors, and then you realize that most of these big nonprofits, you know, I'm not going to name anybody, but name the biggest one that you think is great. They're probably just trying to take care of them themselves. They're, they got an executive director making a million plus dollars, and it's just a horrible business. And I, and I felt, you know, when you, when you have these organizations that are willing to lie, mislead, distort, because they want to to just maintain their existence, or because they think they are the righteous ones, that God is on their side, it just became depressing. And I figured, you know what? Maybe I can just go around and tell people what, what I see happening and then try and break things down and, you know, to the best of my ability, remove extreme biases from a lot of these stories. But I'm not perfect. I do what I can, I guess. This. <laughs> um, but I think I, I want to focus more on this and offline stuff and actually helping guide people to offline like face-to-face -face stuff that Eleanor was talking about I think that that is definitely how to transform more extremist stuff on both sides and then you know additionally just helping people understand that the time that we spend online is it matters and like the places that you visit matter and the place that you give clicks and give your energy matters like that is actually what manifests power structures on the internet so you know don't like find use all the old stuff like we all have to to a certain degree but it's really important to give at least some amount of your energy towards the new emerging platforms and then yeah being offline as much as you can too. Um, so I'm, I'm a journalist as well. Uh, I'm also an activist and an organizer, and so I try to, uh, also as a creative activist, I try to use creative mediums to promote socio-political change. Um, so that's what I do on a, on a daily basis. And I also think, to, to Daniel's point, that the alt-right has created a culture. Uh, there are a lot of other cultures that have created, um, but not created, but they're being noticed. For example, I mean, we're all white on this stage. Um, but I think that like what Black Lives Matter has created, what uh, the indigenous um, movements have created from Standing Rock to Louisiana, um, I think those are cultures and movements and messages that are becoming part of the zeitgeist. So it's not just the alt-right, and I think that's important to note because I think that the next generation is also latching on to these new cultural ideas as well. Uh, that are gaining popularity and, and, and gaining esteem, so. Just a quick jump in on that. I just think it's really important to understand the, the nuance involved in, you know, when you're talking about the alt-right or Black Lives Matter or indigenous movements, like, these are not black and white movements in themselves, Antifa, whatever it is. They're all extremely complex with many different factions inside of them. So it's not just X is good, Y is bad. There, we have to keep digging in to what is good and what is bad in each of these. Oh yeah, I was just pointing out no, that they're not the more. only um, movement that's getting steam or popularity. Yeah, for sure. The, the very fact that you're here tonight gives me a great sense of hope. Do you know how many people there are in the world? And how many people that we know, where you ask them, did you have an argument with somebody today? Did you talk about something political? Did you say something right? Somebody say no. You know what we're talking about tonight on TV? The weather. The snow. Oh, for God's sake, it's going to snow. Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> for 30 years, I started with talk radio. Remember that? Talk radio. Rush the book. This was the biggest thing for 30 years I've been through. Oh, 
first, every argument there is, the fairness doctrine, you're going to live through that one. But I have spent all of my adult waking hours in one form or another talking about something, arguing whatever. And I will say this in a lot of respect. I love you all. I don't care what you think. I thought you were going to come to blow with YouTube before about idea, but it was music to my ears. And you, sir, I have no idea what you said. But it was said. But there's a brilliance of that that we're not talking about the weather. Here we are. We're doing something, all of us in our own little ways. Look at sticks. There isn't a bomb shelter. Bless his heart. <laughs> And he is doing, he, we, we are talking to computers and I'm talking about things, the complexities of stuff. And I'm wondering, what am I doing? Here I am, and I can't help it. It's like we were born to do this. Just respect what people are saying. You don't have to agree with it. Just do what I do. Just say, interesting. And move on. <laughs> and behind your back. But that's what we do. Because there are people that I know who say, what do you think about this? No, seriously, what's your passion? What is it you are? What is it? You're an activist. You know how many de-activists I know? People are the same. They don't know. They're lethargic. They're torpid. They don't. They're just, it's not that they've given up. I don't know if it's a fluoride in the water. That's what it is. And the fact that you said that, the fact that you, this reminds me of like the 60s. Because I remember it was kind of a kid. But there was this thing where we talked about love and peace and anti-war, and it was serious, and music was politics. It was a, I, I guess I'm going back to that. Mm -hmm. So the fact that we're here today is hope. And it's everybody did what we did, just had an opinion about something, and kept up, and got in people's faces, and drove people nuts. I'm sure we all have family members that go, oh God, here he comes again. Here we <laughs> go. That's what changed. That's what changed the book. That's what this is about. And remember, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't speak. That's, right. That's all I'm saying. Say whatever it is, no matter how insane it is. But I'd rather you say it than not be able to. That's it. Woo! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sticks? <laughs> I would say paired with that, it's just the spread of education, of information in general through the internet has become such a massive juggernaut. And it's, it's a great thing. It's not just politics. It's not just society. That's certainly being driven by it and driving it, driving the conversation. Uh, everything, uh, spirituality certainly is part of this. Uh, literature is now far more widely available than at any other time in, in human history up until about 30 years ago it was basically print. That's all you had for the most part. You might be able to get something. You could print it out maybe at home, uh, you know, less expensively, but ultimately, you know, it was physical copies and you couldn't really find it even on the early internet. Now you can find anything. You can find absolutely any text that you want. It's 2,000 years old. Somebody scanned it from some library collection and they put it on archive.org or any of a million other sites. It's a juggernaut of information. The worst thing that we could possibly do at this point is let up when we are developing now the next wave of tech. You know, Mr. Mr. Amin developing at Minds, Gab is there, you've got fundraising platforms, you've got you know video hosting alternatives. These are all great things, I think, for the development, not just of culture and of, of uh, politics and the critique of society, but for everything else under the sun as well. We can't let up and we have to work as hard as we can towards these things. And that do, uh, you know depends on a person's skills too. One person might be very good uh, at speaking, another person might be very good at writing. They might not share that in common. Uh, another person may be good at maybe they uh, they grow things. Another person's really good at uh, designing fabrics or, or making clothes. All of these things can be found online, and I think that's the best thing for the world. Thank you. And now we have a question over here with the gentleman. I will move the. Uh... First of all, Stitz, I'd like to thank you for uh, broadcasting yourself and to the capital of capitalism itself, New York. Also, on top of that, I have a question about the overall global state of the internet itself. Right now, as we speak, global penetration rate of broadband is about 50%. That is about half the world's population does not have an internet connection as of this point. If you remember in the early 90s to on this, in the early 2000s, the last in the establishment pushed for broadband expansion across the globe. Right now, the United States is somewhere around 80% broadband penetration. Do you think there'll be a slowdown in broadband penetration into the fact that they've seen things such as WikiLeaks using, using the internet as a platform against the establishment? Thank you. 
Go for it, Stace. I, I, I think in general there won't be a slowdown of the growth of the internet because it's beginning to move into areas where that penetration is a lot less, like maybe parts of Eastern Europe I can remember uh, maybe 10 years ago or something on some of the first uh, blogging endeavors that I used. Uh, there was a thing called revolver maps. I'm not sure if they're even still active because I haven't used it in a while. And you'd look. And if you looked at where people were connecting to your content from, you know, it was fairly popular at the time, literary content mostly. If you looked at where they were connecting from, uh, mm -hmm. it was the United States was lit up like a Christmas tree, Western Europe, Oceania, Japan a bit. And, and there were large gaps in the world where there wasn't much going on. Fast forward even two or three years, and you saw it substantially growing. And it's growing Eastern Europe, Latin America, parts of West Africa, certainly parts of Southeast Asia. And in many cases, it's it's maybe small towns or outlying communities that you know <laughs> lack to basic functions like even maybe electricity in some cases before. I don't think there will be a slowdown in the next 10 to 20 years, except that you know the audience in the U.S. places that were already developed certainly the growth there will slow down. I think you're going to get increasingly uh, more translating software and things of that nature as well. That's something that that alt tech should look into building into their sites the ability of people to uh, seamlessly translate things because a lot of those countries are not English speaking. I think that would be uh, highly beneficial over time. Is nice. Anybody want to add to that or uh, just the next question? All right, next question. Uh, gentleman in the blue. What's your take on some words that come to mind so quickly, guys? Um, soy boy, all, all right, Trump tarts. You like the chance to come with its own from society. I know that in some of your videos of sticks where, you know, you have 10.2. Like, it's really funny and all, but, you know, it's, you know, it's like it's all in subculture. In sense, and I just want to know what your take on that. I, I would say I really love my, I've got the best fans. I'm just going to say that straight up, not to throw shade at anyone, but I get the best fans. It's a spoon clank and 10.2 and stuff like that. It brings endless amusement when people make cartoons. I, I Because I'm not moralistic, because I don't care if things are irrever or irreverent or blasphemous, or even if they insult me, I have a great time even when people make, you know, sly asides about me uh, that would be seen as negative. Any sort of attention in that field helps to promulgate my message. And ultimately, that's a good thing because I fight for people to be able to promulgate all messages. Even if a person has beliefs, opinions that are offensive that I even disagree with, I would be willing to debate them on the point. I think that's something that's different from a lot of people in the in the what I call the lame stream in the establishment. They're not willing to debate any points. They think that if you disagree with them, you're too far out there. It doesn't really matter what direction you're coming from. As for some of the monikers that have been made, like, like Trump Tard and things like that, they can be disrespectful, certainly, but I think that they should be totally allowed. Anybody else want to add on that, or just next question? Good evening. Excellent. You're welcome. Um, on one hand, this is what we're doing right now is probably old school and the best thing an alternative we're doing. We're having FaceTime. This is what was done prior to internet. This is what people did. We agreed or disagreed, but you put one foot forward. You made history with this or figured something out or at least came with a balance. In the beginning, the internet was great, easy, resourceful, made it cocooning, but Regardless of what your uh, culture or political, it's also separated us, and we become cocooned and fearless when we're behind a big glass box. But if you can see what's happening now, a lot of people are scared to talk to each other. There's more loneliness as much as we think we have five thousand friends. True. <laughs> it's funny. I also think that the Trump administration could be the best thing that's ever happened. Only. Because it's finally, wait, only because <laughs> so much shit has finally rubbled up that finally people have to speak up. And this president really didn't say or do anything, period. Not even good or bad. From Me Too, from women's rights, from everything, it seemed like everybody else spoke up because nothing else did it. Maybe it finally came to a bubble. My question to you is, does everybody have an opinion? Are we going to have more FaceTime like this? Are we going to have more people time or 
Is there something more powerful than us? More powerful than the government that's actually watching all this craziness and feeding more into it? Are they going to distract it with silly reality shows while they figure something out? So there's finally a total totalitarian something. Or are we just going through growing pains? Oh, I don't know. That's, that's, that was a lot. I just wanted to kind of bring up, I don't know if it fits exactly, but you mentioned something bigger, controlling things. And there was some other stuff mentioned earlier. I just want to say it is remarkably easy for one person to have a dramatic impact on the entire planet. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize this. So I've, had, I've had these discussions where they assume that if you're not super wealthy, if you're not more powerful than the government, I think one of the reasons we've seen the government go after hackers so heavily in the past several years is because you will, I, I mean, look, there's this guy named uh, Weave, and I don't, I don't know how, how true the story is, but apparently he called Pakistan pretending to be India. He spoofed their, the phone number of the ambassador and threatened nuclear war. It's just one guy with a, with a spoofing hat. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't need to be a, a, a power greater than the government to produce propaganda or dictate us or try and create a totalitarian system. Could be a very small group of powerless people who have power now that we have you and I, i'd also like to point out that the online and offline aren't necessarily mutually exclusive places i know a programmer who created a website where people can find if there's anybody in their community that they can meet up with and talk politics so you can use online platforms in order to create the face-to-face -face, uh, presence that I, i i do think is required to have these important conversations, because like you said, everyone's safe behind the behind the computer. Um, so I think like in terms of, of, of greater powers, this it's hard to even say this without sounding trite, but I think the power of people working together towards a goal and working in solidarity with one another on a wide range of issues to better their community, to better their you know existence, is that higher power, so to speak. And I think that that combined with the online and offline worlds will be what takes us forward. You know, since the beginning of time, whenever anybody's added something to our uh, little palette, they've said, this is horrible. Well, as soon as there was the train, the, the iron horse, this is the worst thing. What do you mean it connected us? No, we're leaving and families are broken apart. You name it. I'm sure the person who said, look, I've got this thing called a knife. You could cut things with it. I can fix skin. I'm sure he was stabbed immediately thereafter. So we've been talking about this since, since day one. There's always been this terrible thing about, but there's this, I'm not here, by the way. But there's this, there's this interesting paradox, which I find fascinating. We are, we have the, the, the library in Alexandria in our pocket. How many times have you been someplace and you said, when did Newt Rockman die? You said, who the hell is Newt Rockman? Just a minute, and I've got this answer. And yet we know nothing. We write constantly and can't write. We can't write. We were the, the love letter, the what? The love, nobody's writing, but we're writing constantly. No, we're not, these are glyphs and semi, whatever. So there's this wonderful paradox. There, there's this wonderful, and there's this weird thing about taking this separation. Because one of these days when you're going to be found guilty, when we go to RFID chips, I'm gonna be crazy for a moment. We have little <laughs> chips in us, and we're gonna, and kids are gonna stand in line and wait, and they go, look at this, here I am, I don't need a wallet. I've got this chip in my hand, I've got everything. No more easy pass. Look at me. Hey, look, Bob's coming. Why? Because he's not the chip. This is great. And then one day when they find you guilty of something, you're going to go to a judge and he's not going to put you in jail. He's going to just turn your chip off and you're not going to exist. But we're going to sit back in a club like this and say, how in the hell did this happen? This is the part of being cursed with having a brain, having an imagination, being able to marvel at technology, but also being scared witless as to how this thing is, where we're going. It's what, would you ever want to go back? Let me just say something quickly. This got out of the government's hands. I don't know how they turned their back. DARPA wasn't paying attention and we had it. And they've been trying to claw this thing back through CISPA, through, through uh, DMCA, which I've had problems with that, copyright, intellectual property laws, you name it, bullying, libel, Yelp libel. Yo, I didn't like your tacos. You're going to sue me for trying to put this thing back. And they're doing everything in their power. But was there any of us here tonight 
who would ever want to give this back and go back 30 years ago? Is there anybody, despite everything that we've said, anybody? Well, sometimes I'm on a, a telephone attached to my fucking wall so I can find it. And not follow it. I mean, I'll walk around with people say I've been calling all day. I said, well, I forgot I turned my phone down when I was at the studio. Aside from um, that. I mean, <laughs> there were more reasons I want to go back. You know, what what we're not addressing it. here is that we're all building these cocoons online. And they're being built for us when we use Google and we're doing it in social media. People are not being conversant. That's They're swapping true. opinions. Raise your hand. Who wants to have that? You can dialogue. Time capsule back 50 years. Anybody where we're all conversing and we don't. Anybody? Anybody with you? I'm go back. You should let me finish my sentence. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> well, like, I, again, I don't think that they have to be mutually exclusive. Like, the fact that you can go online and create meetup groups, you can go online and create uh, protests, like Facebook events that happen in real life. Like, they don't. Or not Facebook events because screw Facebook, but you get the idea. Like you can use the online platform in order to cre create real life instances. So is that what necessarily what people use the internet for? No. But the point is that you don't have. To, it's not just like going back or going forward. You can use the internet to create those spaces that you had before the internet. I, I don't have a choice, so I can't go back. Why don't but you have a choice? I, can I make it 50 years ago? That's not possible. But, and I, I don't have a choice but to use this, and I use it more often than I'd like to, but I find that sometimes I'm attached to it, and I find that I look at it, all, I wake up in the morning, it's the first thing I look at, I look at it right before I go to bed, the second I get out of work, it's in my hand, and I know that that's not just me. My mo Most of my social interactions are with this, it's, I don't think it's healthy. That's why I said this is the new nicotine. People used to wake up and have a cigarette in the morning. They were commercials for that. But you can go. Yeah. Well, it's not. I don't even think it's the new nicotine. I don't think it's the new nicotine. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, but you said you can put your phone in the other room. Like, you can put your phone in the other room. Like, you can put your phone in the other room. I think it leads to the next question. It's the way. It's, it's, hard. it's the way interactions are now. It's hard. And there's like a whole new level of self-discipline that we don't, that we're not, that we're not good at. But it's so. not just self-discipline. I mean, to go out, to, to meet people, to do things like that, it's really pretty impossible to do without it. I've tried both. It's really pretty impossible to do without it in this day and age. I definitely used to read a lot more long books, and I do miss that. There's a few things that I would go back to. Well, not a lot, but quite a few. And I would like to see a generation, it would be nice if uh, Generation Z had a bit of a taste of what we had 30 years ago in the best way. No, not racism, not violence, not stuff that was like, oh God, this has got to stop. But there were certain things that were great. What do you think? Well, it is, yeah. it is how it is. There's a, there's a new, like, yeah, phone, and phone. And the telephone, hey, want to go out? You know, what's it, uh, no, but that's coming kind of here. Like that. There's new products coming out that are actually going to that. It's like new versions of, of old products, like where a phone where you can, it's a new version of phone where all you can do is text and call. Or, you know, so there will be modern versions kind of clinging back to that and entire not, thing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Again, we don't really have to, but maybe sometimes go back some ways to a little bit of songs of wood. I love technology, I love progress. He mentioned music. Yeah, you know what? Today, we can take our music collection with us. And it could be 10,000, whatever, we could take it across the street on vacation and it'd still be safe at home at the same time. 30 years ago, no, you had to have a truck. Yeah. <laughs> Before we move on to the next question, uh, Sticks, do you have any comments? Yes, I would say as someone who proudly has never owned a smartphone and who tries not to carry his cheap ass track phone anywhere, if I can't, uh, I don't can't be bothered to because I never use it. And I don't really care. It's just for emergencies. Uh, I would say the internet, in some cases, can really be helpful uh, for coordinating people's social uh, interactions. For instance, I live in an area that's fairly rural. There aren't that many people physically around me now. What's the guarantee that any of those people? has anything significantly enough in common with me at all for me to form, you know, maybe a, a friendship stronger than, hey, you know, you know, how's the weather? Hey, how's it hanging by? Uh, there's no guarantee of that. You're in, in you know, most of you, uh, I assume, live uh, in or around the New York uh, metro region. 
Well, that's a very large place there to, you know, uh, I think what, 15, 20 million people within the metro area. Here it's small town America. There's, I think, a bit of a cultural difference between the two, but I'm not glued to my phone. Uh, I think that increasingly we're seeing perhaps that people are uh, coming unglued from such things, but they've got to be there. We can't put the genie back in the bottle. This is now the main form of human communication. It's no longer interpersonal. There, there, there are pros and there's cons to it. Um, it's created stronger connections between some people over longer distances. But at the same time, I think one of the problems we are seeing, if I could be a little negative, because I love mobile technology, I love the internet, but I just want to point out that it seems like we are moving in a direction where people are actually shocked if you talk to them in real life. You know, a, buddy of made, a buddy of mine made a video where he's, he's like in the New York subway, and he's like, you look around at the, the, you know, how many million people travel in subway, never once look at each other, talk to each other, and here they are in the same city, probably working right next to each other, and never once say, how are you doing? Yeah. Well, the fact that Sticks doesn't have a cell phone, is, you know, <laughs> that's evidence that it can be done. I mean, he's a major public figure on YouTube, very embracing the technology, but also simultaneously <laughs> having the discipline to control his own life. So it's a that's cool. Don't worry. I visited the Hopi uh, Indians in Arizona, and uh, one of the elders was talking about how their culture had been uh, diminished by the roads, which allowed for cars to travel between the different bases. And I was like, okay, like you know, they forced these roads on you. You know, the U.S. government kind of forced them on you. What would you do? And he was like, oh well, I'd smash them up. And I realized I'd never in my life thought about the idea that you could smash up a road uh, and just go back, you know. And, and actually, if people began to realize that they had lost, um, you know, significant kind of aspects of maybe, you know, being able to have deeper connection, deeper communion, you know, it, it, it might be that in some future point we'll, we'll want to become almost like post-technological. And, and we'll think about, you know, like, I mean, if I visit, like I visited Amazonian tribes in the rainforest, and you know their culture is so incredibly rich in so many levels compared to ours, including their connection to nature and, and um, you know visionary technologies uh, like ayahuasca and so on. That you know in a way we can be seen as a much poorer culture, much much more modern culture, much more trapped in, in very limited uh, relationship to a very ecologically reduced uh, environment. So anyway, something to think about. I wanted to point out one thing too of why I would never go back. One thing, this, was, this information was really profound to me because I never really thought about it. I don't know if it matters to you, but uh, lethal crime and death have, have gone down significantly because of cell phone technology. Uh, you know, 50 years ago, if someone got stabbed or shot or fell down and hit their head, how long until paramedics could arrive on scene? Today, we all have cell phones, and it's very, very quick <coughs> to how it used to be. So I think. We can consider that as a really powerful net positive. We save a lot of lives. All right, so you want to do like three more? Yeah, let's do three more. Lewis, you're up. Uh, yeah, sure. So it seems pretty obvious to me that we're on the cusp of a mean revolution and thus a mean war. Um, so this question is for Mr. Pinchbeck and Stick specifically. Um, I, I would like you to talk a little bit about how memetics, uh, censorship, and the occult form our reality today and how that's going to play out or how that might play out in the coming years. <laughs> Sticks, you want to get that one first? Sure. I would say that the occult melds with human psychology and with propaganda. Uh, the, the meme war never ended. It began and has been ongoing. It's just there was a lull there for a while because I think the establishment looked at what was happening, realized how quickly things were moving, got so confused it didn't even bother to respond right away. They were sweating bullets, they had to regroup before they could formulate a strategy, but propaganda is very much uh, in, in implementation right now by corporations, by political powers, and it's on both ends. There are those that uh, attempt to employ these things in order to perpetuate freedom, uh, maybe uh, rip apart the old establishment because we're like, well, they start wars and do crazy things, so you know we're tired of that now. And then there are people on the other side, they're like, no, 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 we've built this multi-billion dollar corporate empire, we can't let it get pissed away, so we have to do something about this. Uh, memetics, in the strictest sense, is, if, as far as spiritual memetics go, is the hijacking of the reasoning mechanisms of a, of a person's brain. 
Thus, you can cause uh, strange associations within their mind between things that are technically not related. Um, you can certainly, you, there are all sorts of techniques you can use. I made a post on Minds about this, I think, two days ago. Uh, there are all sorts of things that are done by corporations rendering people to the one dimensional. For instance, they would say that a, a person is irredeemable or deplorable, you might say. And so you can simply forsake their arguments. Any other thing that they say, even if it's totally sensible and sane, it no longer matters because you've given them a one dimensional moniker. Well, it's propaganda. It can be done in a spiritual manner, too. Uh, literally, uh, yeah, the most uh, obvious uh, example was Keck. Now, I've seen write-ups about Keck. Think about this. We have this ancient Egyptian frog god being unironically referenced in mainstream publications at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and by people who are heavy-hitting career politicians whose uh, you know, uh, decades might be spanned in terms of their political careers. They are unironically referencing these things. They unironically use the term meme, even if they don't really understand what it means. They talk about Pepe and a million other things. You, you've got them being listed as like hate symbols and all sorts of other things under the sun. Could we possibly have imagined prior to the rise of the kind of grassroots talk we get on, on YouTube and elsewhere on the internet, could we possibly have imagined an election like the last one and the things surrounding it, which is now metastasized, it's gone far beyond the US, to basically every corner of the world. And it's becoming a mainstream mode of human communication. The use of a, a symbol or a picture, a cartoon, something funny to encapsulate an idea or, or something along those lines is very, very common now. It wasn't really that common even a few years beforehand. Um, when, yeah, the, the cult is not necessarily negative, right? You know, that a cult means hidden. And you know, I, I'm personally from having explored shamanism and psychedelics and other types of stuff. I do, I do believe in the occult. I believe there are these hidden dimensions that influence our human reality and, and, and work through it in different ways. And there are you know, more positive ones and, and more negative ones. And yeah, they they, they operate through a language of, of symbols and uh, sometimes secret societies and, and so on. So yeah, I, 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 I do think there's a level where that's all taking place. I'm not quite sure what else you're interested in. Um, I guess just talking more about like what are those <laughs> systems at play and how do they affect you know the reality that we're all living in this whole censorship debate like the manipulation of information trying to get the truth out. How does how do these symbols how does this occult paradigm or the hidden knowledge play into all of this? Well, the occult has always uh, propped up the concept of liberty. In, in the strictest sense, you have to be at liberty to even study the spiritual. The concept of the old, uh, very hierarchical orders of organized religion is something the occult tends to oppose. Uh, symbolism used in, in the realm of propaganda on a spiritual level uh, has begun to mesh, I think, with politics and society in general. You see uh, the return of neo-paganism. Uh, in the wake of sort of the 1980s and 1990s has now been directly influenced by the internet as well. The meshing together is partially literary. Of course, as I stated before, I, you know, in the first uh, segments, the availability of the spiritual goes hand in hand with the availability especially of books because you're, when you're talking about spiritual lore up until you know, basically the 90s, it's all in print. A lot of those are rare, privately printed, very, uh, very ancient. Uh, and so they've been released to the general public. We are seeing a, a renaissance within the occult that's very much like the occult renaissance we had maybe in, in the early 1900s as radio and, and early wave electrical uh, sort of things spread around. There's more printing going on. Psychology, science, politics, all of these things at that time were meshed with the spiritual too. Now we've seen the good and bad side of this. Uh, for every bit of Atlantean lore where some group of people decides, well, we're, we're going to be very positive, we're going to grow things, eat organic, uh, we're, we're going to you know, be green hedge witches or something. For every group that's like that, you also have a group that might be tinged by actual extremism, actual violence. They may say, well, they may become a doomsday cult. They may become uh, spiritual fanatics uh, under the banner of some political system. I think that's something we have to look out for. But generally speaking, those that are making the memes are not, you know, you've been told probably, well, it's Russia. It's state actors or their cohorts doing this. That's not my experience. My experience 
at, at least in my opinion, based on what I've seen, it's primarily grassroots. And it's primarily meant for benevolent, I think, purposes. Yeah, but I guess like I would hope that in the future, like, the focus of human society turns away from wealth or material accumulation, more towards inner development, uh, occult development, you know, which is what something like William Steiner talked about uh, and explored in every possibility. I mean, you know, I think we have a lot of latent capacities, psychic abilities, you know, energy forces like chi and kundalini that, um, you know, we could have like schools, you know, like training grounds where these become a part of our basic, you know, human rights in a way to, to explore our, our inner resources um, beyond, beyond what we now even imagine that is possible. My own experience has suggested a lot more is possible than, than we now know, or now we now accept. Um, and yeah, beyond that, yeah, there is, you know, negative, I believe negative occult forces, you know, operating through, you know, masonry, you know, skull and bones, all, all that kind of stuff. I think that's one level, but I, I don't really see it as conspiratorial so much. I feel it's like, a, you know, it's like a co-creation, like our, our, the human psyche kind of co-creates with these like astral or natural realms in some sense. But we have to become more, you know, consciously aware of, of our co-creations, our projections. I want to also ask if there is any thoughts on uh, Moloch, who on the internet is considered to be the uh, arch enemy of Ket, depicted as a bull that the uh, frog god fights with. Uh, there are these uh, theories about how the elite worship Moloch, and he's this entity that they uh, give children to and all this kind of stuff. And I'm just curious, uh, Daniel, in your experiences, have you encountered, especially after the uh, synthetic DMT trip that you had, these kind of entities. Hold on a second. Hey, Ian, you don't want to drink and you wait like 10 minutes. Okay. What's that? What was your experience after the uh, synthetic DM, DM trip, DMT trip when it comes to all these demonic forces? And do you see something like Moloch, which was a Canaanite entity back in the day, still being talked about today as being particularly uh, relevant in such a way as the darkness that we have to overcome when we go into the light? Uh, yeah, it sort of takes us like, off. Topic. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I mean, yeah, I think I'm going to pass it out for now. We'll talk about the person. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would just quickly add, there is a bull just downtown on Wall Street, and they did recently give the bull a child statue. So, you know, take that however you want. All right. Next question uh, from the gentleman over here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is for Bill specifically and for Mike. Uh, first of all, I'm a fan of your work and I really like uh, the Mike's platform as a user. Um, and I feel like creating a network for the people by the people is hard. Um, and I see that you guys are trying to do that by having features like, for example, I can not only boost a post uh, that I made, uh, first of all, using credits that I've gained from sharing my content, so I'm getting paid for that, which is great. But I can boost the post also uh, that you made if I believe in the cause or foundation or an idea that you put out there, right? Uh, which kind of uh, suggests that, you know, my main platform is uh, believing in humanity and consciousness at the same time and trusting that uh, probability is that out of two million users that mine has, uh, majority of them would support the right causes, the right ideas, and uh, believe the right news, and you know, uh, support that. Uh, I just wanted to know if there's any way you are, as a platform, are monitoring the morality and the accuracy of content that's uh, being mostly boosted or sponsored or seen by the users. I think providing more tools for the community to make decisions on what's true. And I think the metrics on the post do show a degree of what people think, but I, I actually do agree with the ability for the community to kind of help label content and provide primary sources, provide peer review, try to understand what is true and what's not going to mean. Honestly, right now we have pretty limited resources for going through and, and verifying content. And even uh, you know, Tim's been going into this with some of his videos, like you know, with what is true and what, what like there there is truth. I think we think that, 
Um, so, but also getting into content is a little bit of a luxury that we haven't really had the ability to do yet. So, I mean, I think definitely in the future, helping people uh, become educated more to understand what's true, and maybe some sort of metrics around the post to help disclose what the community thinks. What do you think? Yeah, I think those metrics should be there. Uh, uh, especially, um, I know it's difficult to like judge morality, because it's personal. You, cannot, you can judge accuracy for sure, but you can make sure that content that's not accurate is not being pushed out like fake news, etc. The morality is like, you know, everyone has their own morals, and you cannot be like, okay, this content cannot be good because I feel it's a moral. That's a good one for us. Yeah, I mean, you, can, you can definitely take a collective vote on that for sure. Mm -hmm. There's a way to do that. But even accuracy for fake news is very difficult. Yeah, but it can it can be cross checked, so it, it can be out there. Well, the knife the knife media I've been uh, talking about that yeah. recently because they've done some really good work where they actually uh, they say that they're putting the scientific method into tracking news stories for bias and slant. But I mean, even when you have very large news organizations that you want to trust, they get things wrong too. So you know, there, there's been a string of really bad reporting from like ABC, CNN, and now the AP. And if if the biggest news outlets are you know get get big stories wrong, we just will never know for sure. All right, I think we should wrap. It there up. is one last uh, gentleman there with a question, and uh, that's it. No more questions right. after that gentleman. Let's do it. And, um, there's a guy who's running for Congress, Paul Newman, who is uh, campaigning on proposing anti-censorship legislation. I just wanted to know what you thought of that. Sure. Hang on. Yeah, I don't know. Where do we go then? He's talking about <laughs> Uh, his name is Paul Nalen. He's running for uh, Congress in Wisconsin. He's uh, proposing anti censorship legislation, so I just wanted to know what you thought of that. I would want to know what that Yeah, specifically what it says. Yeah, like um, what? I, I guess just using the government to enforce the uh, First Amendment. And, uh, all other I mean, so, just to kind of add to this a little bit, is we're all moaning about YouTube. Facebook, Google, I mean, these are centralized platforms that exist, and we don't have to use them. Um, so, you know, you can watch a video, you can send me a video, you don't have to use YouTube to do that. But we do need the internet to be able to share that. And the internet, since really its inception, has been a, a platform that is totally free. You can do whatever you want. And that's mainly by net neutrality and other uh, things like that. Net neutrality is being pretty much broken apart in the last few months. So net neutrality really was protecting what you were asking for. So you don't need a censorship law because you can make a website like mine. Disclaimer, I do work for mine. <laughs> um, but yeah, people can do that. And you can make a website. But now with net neutrality being, you know, Ask away. You're going to not be able to make these words. Be very careful what passes for net neutrality, especially Title II changes that one would consider or treat the internet as a utility, which could be there for subject to licensing. So it's a great concept. But remember, whenever the government gives you a great sounding thing, no child left behind, Affordable <laughs> Care Act, uh, uh, military, uh, whatever. But it, it, it's very the idea behind. You know, not looking at packets, not seeing where it's going to. It's a, it's a, it's basically like setting a letter in the post. The mail is not reading that. They're not looking at, you know, what's in your package that they're sending to someone because they don't like what's in it. And that's really what the legislation should be about to protect it. And similar platforms such as, you know, if, if you have an iPhone, there's no way you can get any apps on your phone without being approved by Apple. So really, that that's a big problem. Android's fine. You can get apps from elsewhere. You can jailbreak an iPhone, sir. You can jailbreak an iPhone. You can, but most people don't know how to do that. So it, it should be easy for people to do that. So what, what about the Internet Bill of Rights? Do we uh, talk about that or no? We can end on that because that seems to be a pretty uh, good idea. I know. What do you think, Six? Sorry there, my thing wasn't appearing for a moment. Uh, I support the concept of an Internet Bill of Rights. It should simply be this. Because sites work with government entities, whether they're domestic or foreign, they should be explicitly constrained by the First and Fourth Amendments. It's really that simple. Again, it's, it's more about pragmatism than it is actual legalese. 
Uh, like I understand the fact that there's no constitutional prohibition on a company kicking someone off their platform for breaking some obscure TOS. They can make that whatever they want, but do we want a society like that? Um, now I would say as far as Neelan goes, uh, I haven't looked at the specific legislation. If it does just that and says, well, you know, websites uh, can't censor, you know, merely harmful material, it has to be specifically criminal under U.S. law. Yes, it's something I would basically support, but I'll, I'll say it this way. I'm sorry, isn't Neelan like a really racist, like, anti-Semite yeah. guy? Neelan definitely has out there beliefs, but insofar as he's just proposing that, it doesn't matter who's proposing it, if it is fundamentally a good idea. We've got to, we've got to get past the point at which we give in to the one dimensionality, which I previously spoke of. We can't just say, well, that person's a kook or that person's racist uh, in some way. And so any idea they happen to make has to be part of that one dimensional caricature. A person can have uh, a very skilled person might be totally flawed in their personal life. A person who's basically a saint might be totally inept. Uh, we have to get past that. But yes, I would generally support the basic idea, but maybe it should be limited by market cap. For instance, like a site that has become quasi monopolistic instead of trying to break it apart, which the government never has the balls to do anyway, they're never going to apply anti monopoly laws to any meaningful degree online. Um, just make it so that a site that is above a certain cap is a de facto public utility without giving any of the legal precedent to the government to license anything. But I would point something else out with net neutrality. People who are really on board with preserving it don't seem to understand a domain registrar can abuse things the same way as an ISP. Why is it that the ISP should be restrained from throttling a site and the domain registrar shouldn't? You need that or, or indexing sites, like Google's own search methodology. It is basically a monopoly. All the other search engines just use Google anyway and apply extra layers to it. I, I, I just want to say too. Wait, let, sorry, let Mark just. Oh, yeah. You good? Well, because to a degree, I mean, you don't need to use DNS. DNS is, 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 is you know, the domain name services are basically services put in there for people to root things through. So, I mean, you can make another one. You can you can set up your own that people point theirs to. Um, you, you're just using a, a, a community there of DNS providers. You can use someone else. But with the internet, unless you're going to put uh, your own cables to every single person in the world, that's really kind of out of the question. So, you know, the, the DNS isn't that, I mean, it should be protected as well. Um, and so should the, the domain registrars and things like that. And, and to a degree they were until they were, you know, given away um, a, a few years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I think I kind of. I, I think my personal challenge with it is you have to regulate basically every step of the way into a platform, right? So you're talking about DNS, the registrars, Basically, any company that supports you in any way has to be regulated because, you know, what we, what we saw with what happened with Gab or like the Daily Stormer, different companies through the pipeline have terms of terms and conditions. So, uh, with I think it was I'm not sure if it was Gab, but they the, the domain registrar said, "Oh, you're violating hate speech by using by the social platform because of what users are saying," so they kick you off. An Internet Bill of Rights wouldn't just be for specifically one company or the platform. You have to you'd have to regulate everything. And I think the challenge with that is if you try to play something, when you try to put a system in place that affects numerous systems, you're going to create a whole lot of bugs. I think that's it. It's big. We'll continue. Thank you, everybody, Thanks, everybody. for being a part of this.